Wolf Pack, what is going on? It's your boy, the Wolf of Rose Street. Rose Street Journal, I call me Breed and Feed. You fantasy wolves here. Draft of the year. Super pumped to be diving into today a topic that we started to discuss at the end of last show. And that's kind of how it's going to go is we'll figure out what we want to talk about. Value holes, burning questions. What is still left to figure out this offseason once the draft hits? Because there is still some huge fantasy value to be mined out there once we see where these rookies land and the remaining free agent core. So me and Mo have listed out some of the most valuable openings and positions that we cannot wait to see how they get filled. And as we're drafting today, where we're trying to shoot for and see, hey, maybe we can land the Cowboys running back one, the Chargers receiver one, as a little preview of some of the talking points we're going to get to. But it's really crucial to have that list ahead of time so you know what you're checking off for as we go through the draft, what holes we need to see filled and how they're going to matter. So I can't wait to dive in. My man, Mo, how are you doing today? Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, yeah, so we, we've been talking about finding value the last couple of weeks, taking advantage of where the, the public might be lacking in terms of ADP. And a lot of those value holes are going to be filled during the draft, but it, it's still going to it's still going to play a role throughout the offseason. I mean, some some teams might not add where they think where we think they should. Some teams might add where we think they shouldn't. So things are going to be continue to be shaken up throughout the offseason. And this is a conversation I think we're going to be having up all the way up until August. Where, where can we take advantage, um, especially in the running back rooms? I'm, I'm really excited to start with these running backs and just see where we might be able to take advantage of. And like you said, uh, the, the Chargers and the Cowboys are some of the the bigger names that we're looking at. And I guess we can, uh, we can start out here with the, with the Cowboys and most notably um, they, they depart for the, Tony Pollard departs from Dallas and that, that leaves Rico Dowdle who just signed a one year, $1 million deal within the last 10 days. They just brought him back in. And then the little man Deuce Vaughn is still in the building. So um, unless you're some Rico Dowdle truther, it's pretty obvious that the, the Cowboys are lacking here and they're, they're going to have to add someone. And in the last couple of days, there's a report out from Jeremy Fowler over at ESPN that there's mutual interest between Ezekiel Elliott and the Cowboys in a potential reunion, which is not exactly exciting and probably not what everyone wants to be seeing. But I mean, it makes sense. And then the I have about 40 percent of uh, Zeke in best ball. We've talked about him at the end of every yeah. half so far. So maybe no one wants to see it other than me because I would love it right now. And it makes perfect sense. As ugly as it would be. Yeah, I, I wouldn't hate seeing this. <laughs> it, yeah, in terms of, uh, yeah, your best ball bags and uh, finding some value there in the last seven, like you, you could get them in the last round of drafts a couple of weeks ago. But um, yeah, but uh, the other way that they might be adding is through the draft and a lot of a lot of people would prefer for them to go that direction and they've been linked to some interesting names some of those second to third round talents like um trey benson and the hometown guy jonathan brooks but um regardless of where who they add the the person that gets added is going to be in a great position like i said tony pollard just left the town just left town and he's leaving a pretty gaping hole in this offense he handled 60 percent of the carries last year maintained a 12 percent target share which is okay for a running back and he maintained he can't he handled 60 percent of the carries inside of the five with 16 total carries coming inside the five which was 17 seventh most among all running backs and Pollard last season, 16.1 expected fantasy points per game, which was among the top tier running backs. And just in general, outside of Tony Pollard, the, the, the running backs in Dallas have been successful over the last 10 seasons. The Cowboys have produced a running back, the running back 15 or better in, in every single season since 2013. That's been names like Tony Pollard, Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, Darren McFadden and DeMarco Murray. Yeah. He, like Going all the way back to those days in Dallas, they, they're continuing to pump out fantasy-relevant running backs. So no matter who it ends up being, and if somehow Rico Dowdle skates by, even if it's him, just whoever it is, I, I think you have to have some excitement. Yeah, high-end RB2 at minimum after all the big free agents are gone at this point. Yeah, it's probably going to be a rookie that ends up shaking it up. But you look at it. Zeke, RB2, 10, 5, 4, 9, 6, up until 2021, when then it became the Tony Pollard show, running back 7, running back 10. Everybody, yeah, he had a, a disappointing year relative to what his expectations were last year, but still was a top 10 fantasy running back that year as well. And then the, the Darren McFadden highlight is a phenomenal because you had DeMarco Murray for a couple of years, like breaking fantasy there. 
And then it's like, well, uh, there's no one here. It can't be anybody that's going to have a great season. And McFadden whipped out a thousand yards in a top 15 season there. So I agree with you. Whoever ends up being is going to be in a phenomenal A plus spot here. And there are some rumblings. I saw this one today that Jonathan Brooks, the Texas rookie, well, his training staff, uh, the head trainer at Texas has been hired by the Cowboys. And there's lots of dot connecting going around now that they're going to push for Brooks, who says he's going to be ready for camp. And on a lot of people's boards, the number one running back, if he is healthy, that could be a really intriguing fit and makes him. That's why we've been taking so many stabs at rookie running backs, regardless of who they are. Because if you find that right one, if it's Braylon Allen, if it's even Audrey Castine at the end of the draft, whoever it might be, someone should likely inherit that lead role. And it's going to be insanely valuable, even if the line's a little bit less impactful as what we've seen Tyron Smith now gone. It's not quite that dominant road grading. It's still probably a top half line in the league. And we know it's going to be a top five ish scoring offense after finishing third in overall points in the second half of the year. I mean, they were number one by miles in terms of point score when they finally turned on the key. So yeah, that is by far, in my opinion, the number one burning question across all positions across the fantasy universe is who is going to be that number one running back for the Cowboys. And hey, if it is Rico Dottle, I'd probably consider him a top 15, 20 overall running back pick just because of the environment, not because of the players. So we shall see. Another really strong one, though, is the Chargers. And yes, we know they've added Gus Edwards, and he likely will inherit that goal line role. They've already referred to him as the bell cow. So they aren't going into the season thinking they have to into this draft replace Gus Edwards by any means they could be satisfied with him being their lead back and if it ends up being so he's gonna be a screaming value going at 120 ish right now in early drafts and even if they do add somebody it most likely as you noted on here will likely be a lightning compliment to him and you listed a few names that really would intrigue you as a lightning compliment who are a few that you've listed out here yeah uh Jalen Wright from Tennessee uh one of those guys who's popped during combine and his pro day um he's projected to go in the third, maybe fourth round. And that's about where people are expecting the Chargers to take a look at running back um, if they do. And he just profiles to be that athletic, uh, give, it, give you an extra burst running back um, compliment to Gus Edwards. So he has the profile to fit around, be the complimentary back to Gus Edwards. And I think Marshawn Lloyd does as well. The, the guy out of USC, similar projected draft capital to Jalen Wright third, fourth round, one of those mid-round picks. And like I said earlier, the, the Chargers may be taking a running back in that range. So I, I, I'm look, if I'm looking to target who may be the, um, the Chargers' second in command at running back, I, I'm looking for one of those flashy guys because we know what we're getting with Gus Edwards. He, he's not great in the receiving game. He put up career numbers last year, and it wasn't because he proved that he somehow improved in the receiving game. It's just more that they didn't really have anyone else out of the backfield to be catching passes. I mean – it's Gus Edwards versus Justice Hill. It's just kind of pick your poison there. So um, Gus Edwards not really a threat in the receiving game. So I expect if they add a running back, which I expect they will, it'll be one of those guys who has a solid receiving profile and can be that extra spark in the offense. And it, it's a uh, it's interesting with Greg Roman coming into um, Los Angeles taking over. Um, during Greg Roman's time in Baltimore, no running back cracked the 35 receptions mark. I, I think the best was Devonta Freeman with 34 and I believe 2019, maybe 2020. So not exactly what you want to be seeing. And Roman has primarily used larger backs um, in a ground and pound style attack. Think back to Gus Edwards the last couple of years, Lat Murray over the last couple of years, just not great in terms of uh, – if you're looking to have some sort of explosive offense and usage from an explosive player, but you have to think back to these last couple of years, the Ravens running back room has been pretty messy. A lot of injuries to guys like Keaton Mitchell, JK Dobbins. So they've kind of had to use just a mix of these like washed up veterans and just guys who can take carries and eat up snaps. And they haven't really had Greg Roman never really had a game changer at running back during his time in Baltimore. So it'll be interesting to see how he uses a dynamic running back if they end up drafting one, because they Roman's never really used this during his time in Baltimore. It's just ma mainly been those stereotypical plotters. So I don't think we're, you should be too concerned about the lack of receiving work for running backs in Roman's recent offenses, just because there, there really hasn't been much talent. Yeah, and, and also part of that is probably Lamar Jackson not needing to dump it off, running for the first downs when it's available to him. There's plenty of fantasy research out there on mobile quarterbacks and the benefits in terms of opening the cutback lanes and all that stuff, but also the detriments in terms of receiving share. And we know, yeah, there's some athleticism to Justin Herbert for sure, but it's not Lamar Jackson 
running for first downs out there. And I did look back at also when Greg Roman was last paired up with Jim Harbaugh back when he was with the 49ers for four years. And just in general, too, the one thing that is nice about this is we'll talk about how small the aerial pie is going to be there with the Chargers, but it's also an enormous running back share in terms of a total ground pie. They ranked Greg Roman offense's top three in total carries in all but one of his 10 seasons, and that includes in those 49er years where he didn't have a quarterback running all over the place in Alex Smith. Short Kaepernick did eat some of that too. But yeah, this offense has historically been so powered on the run. It's a creative scheme. Running backs consistently average five plus yards. A carry Mark Ingram had his career year after a solid New Orleans day. Comes over to the Ravens, has a top 10 fantasy season there. So there is plenty of upside. I looked at Frank Gore over those four seasons and he had 313 opportunities his first year under Greg Roman, 1,300 yards of scrimmage, eight touchdowns. Next season, 294 opportunities, 1,448 yards, nine touchdowns. And then the next year, another 1,269 yards from scrimmage, another 292 opportunities. She touches rather in addition to 27 targets, nine touchdowns and over 1,217 yards from scrimmage. Again, so four years running with over 1,200 total yards, three of those four seasons, nine plus touchdowns as well for Frank Gore. So it is a very valuable spot, even with the looming Gus Edwards likely to vulture touchdowns, regardless of who lands here, there is a lot of running back volume up for grabs in this offense. So that makes it our number two running back hole to track. And most of the holes did get filled this off season. We saw Aaron Jones go to the Vikings, the Texans, Joe Mixon, some great, really intriguing, of course, Derrick Henry going to Baltimore spots from the free agents. But one spot that really only got more vacated was the Raiders there. Josh Jacobs going to the Packers who had the most vacated carries in the NFL entering this off season. And now it's just Samir White sitting there at the top. So it would be shocking to see them not add somebody, but there is a real chance, whether it's for Zamir White's value, similar to Gus Edwards, could skyrocket if it's not a huge addition here, or if they do end up going big at the running back position early in a weaker class, sure, but still somebody could be just inheriting a lead back role there for the Raiders. What intrigues you? Why is this our number three running back value hole here? My, what intrigues me is um, first how Antonio Pierce used his running backs. Mm. Um, during his time as the interim head coach and eventually established as the, the actual future head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, there, there's a bell cow role available if someone can surpass Zamir White as the top guy in Las Vegas. Um, after Antonio Pierce took over in week nine, whoever the starting running back was, whether that was Jacobs before he got hurt and then Zamir White after Jacobs was injured, the starting running back handled 75% of the carries or more in eight of the nine games while mm -hmm. Antonio Pierce was the head coach. So he, we've talked about this in the past, but he really likes to ride one running back, whoever that is. And personally, I'm not entirely sold on Zamir White. He had some solid peripheral metrics, but once again, it was a, it was a small sample size. I believe he only was the true starter for four to five games last season. So it wasn't the biggest sample size. So I'm not fully sold on Zamir White. So if, if, a uh, if a running back can come in in the mid to late rounds, I don't think he's going to be a, a factor right away, but with, with the potential of Zamir White being able to be passed up and then a younger guy taking over, if he can take on a bell cow role late in the season, that's going to be incredibly valuable. And that's why I'm, I'm really interested. He's that uh, Antonio Pierce is just one of those coaches who just loves to ride whoever he thinks the guy is. And if someone's able to take that away, for, if, if someone's able to take that away from Zamir White, it's going to be an absolute smash in fantasy. Yeah, and if they're not, Zamir White could be, especially at his price tag, at least an absolute smash. Going after pick 100, was he running back 12, 16, 16, and 20 over his four starts, had over 100 yards rushing in three of those four games as well, and he looked good doing so. I know he's drafted a fourth round or not a lot of draft stock in him, but this guy did have a 90% speed score, 9.82 RAS score at the time of score was the 31st running back out of 1,624 from 18, 1987 to 2022. So not a bad you know, top one percentile in terms of relative athletic score, in terms of speed score. There is a little bit of burst here, and he did pop a bit on the tape there. He's got a pass-catching skill set as well that – you know, Antonio Pierce has already cited and shouted out. Their GM did say at the combine, this is a two-back league, and so I would definitely expect them to be active on draft day, adding somebody. But I wouldn't be shocked if White ends up being that guy, shouldered 70% or more snaps in three of those four games as well. So I, I we'll see who it ends up being, but I agree. This is definitely a valuable backfield based on Pierce's tendencies. And if it's White, then his price tag is going to 
deservedly go up. And if it doesn't, he's going to remain one of the biggest steals in there. In terms of running backs, too, we've hit the the vast majority of the ones I wanted to touch on. I did feel like mentioning the Dolphins just because it is a top five offense and a phenomenal run game. You saw 18 touchdowns go to Raheem Mostert, and maybe it is Mostert right now, a ninth round pick, one of my favorites. We talked about him. Go back and watch last week's value show if you missed it. Both of me and you love Raheem Mostert as a value, but if they do add somebody just studly in this backfield early on, that could be huge. We know Devon Achan, he, he's definitely. Definitely going to have a role. He's so explosive. Certainly somebody here that is important, but there could be that big back compliment that maybe Mostert does see that to somebody. We see it already have near 20 touchdown upside. So that's one to shout out. And eaters. So I'll let you dive under that for a quick second, but it's not really sexy here. Not great lines. Although the Panthers did boost up that middle of the line in the off season. They, they signed two huge guards to two big contracts. So a little bit better there for the Panthers and maybe, he does just end up being Devin Singletary and Chuba Hubbard as the lead backs, and that's going to have a role at their 120 plus price tag here. But there are also plenty of carries up for grabs because neither of those guys are anything other than Jags. So maybe an, a talented rookie landing there could end up with a lead role, and any lead back is worth a look in fantasy because it's a volume driven position. So yeah, between the Dolphins, Panthers, Giants, anything you wanted to add to those before we move to wide receiver? Yeah, just on the Panthers and Giants, those guys, they're um they're kind of just like I like you said, I described them. They're in their innings eaters. They Singletary and Chuba Hubbard, they they both do the job all around well. They they can pass protect. They they're not gonna run, they're not gonna have negative plays, their success rate is reasonably high. They're they're not talented, but they get the job done well enough that coaches like them and they don't mind keeping them on the field. So if someone is talented and especially if someone who's a, a well-rounded running back, especially one who can pass protect and stay on the field for all three downs has a three down skill set. I can easily see one of those guys getting jumped either Chuba Hubbard or Devin Singletary. I mean, I don't think anyone's really going to say that either of those guys are needle movers in terms of talent. So uh, if a talented running back does end up in one of those offenses, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty easy jump to make uh, beyond Devin Singletary or Chuba Hubbard. I mean, Neither of them are particularly valuable offenses in terms of like the overall environment. I mean, no one's really raving about the Giants offensive future and neither are the Panthers. But I mean, regardless, like you said, it's a volume driven position. And if someone can leapfrog either Singletary or Hubbard and into a starting role and take a bulk of the carries, it's going to be incredibly valuable because those are hard to come by in the NFL these days. Absolutely. Well, we'll back. we're going to move on to the wide receiver position as we do. Any thumbs up, likes, shares, retweets, all that good stuff would really, really help us continue to grow. Thanks so much. Over 100 with you already here today. So appreciated. We're going to get that draft in a second, but any help growing the pack would be so greatly appreciated. And get any questions. What backfields are we missing? What are the value holes are you tracking? Definitely let us know here in about 15 minutes, though, we will kick off that draft. Moving, though, to the pass catchers, the wide receivers, and a tight end value hole that we want wanted to shout out and right from the top I'll just say like yeah sure we know the Patriots need a wide receiver there's value in terms of just absolute targets being available but we don't know who the quarterback is we don't know what this offense is going to look like I can't sit here and label that as a clear-cut value hole we're no more we're more so looking at the positions with you know a nice established quarterback but tons of volume still up for grabs there and even though it's this Greg Roman offense we just talked about how great it is for running backs and a run centric attack and bottom three and pass attempts for almost every single year all but one in Greg Roman's career have they been 28th or below in terms of pass attempts in the league so it is not a huge pie and yet we've seen some production there so I'm going to highlight in a little bit the 49ers and Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman's connection just, you know, in that 2011 to 2014 time frame. But we're looking at a Chargers team. Justin Herbert, still one of the most live arms in the league, even if he has been a little underwhelming these last couple of years. There's definitely room now with just Quentin Johnson and Josh Palmer sitting there at the depth chart. And for years, we saw it last year with the Texans, the year before with um, the, the Lions, there's these huge gaping. There's always a team or two that have massive, massive target shares up for grabs. And we have 395 targets up for grabs in Los Angeles, by far the most in the league. That's 63% of their targets, 
50% of their wide receiver targets and air yards are also up for grabs, including 24 inside the 10. So there is a ton of volume, not to mention 53.8% of their tight end targets are also up for grabs. Really just everything's up for grabs here, even if it is a run centric attack. So I think there could be a ton of value to be had here, even if it's going to be this Greg Roman attack. What's your initial reactions? And then I'll talk, dive into some of this 49er stats for you guys. Yes. Yeah, so first off, just looking at what who's there now, we've got the, the first round failure in Quentin Johnson. Oh. I, I, I'm not afraid to call him a failure. Uh, he sucks. He, he could have some middling production at best this year, but yeah, I'm not excited in any way, shape or form about <laughs> Quentin Johnson. And then Josh Palmer is the other guy still in the wide receiver room. Um, I haven't checked in on his price in a couple of days, but uh, uh, a couple of days ago, I mean, he, he was going in the 13th, 14th round the last I checked. And I, I think he's solid uh, at that price. He, he, it's seeming like the way it's shaping up now, he's going to be running routes all season long. And I mean, if you're going to be consistently out there on the field and you've got Justin Herbert as your quarterback, I'm interested given the really low price. But he, uh, as I've said before, he's not one of those needle movers for me, but the, the charges are shaping up to 100% add a wide receiver at some point in the draft. Um, so the first most obvious um, option at number five overall is um, one of the big three wide receivers, either mm-hmm. um, neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr. or Romo Dunze. But um, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more steam for them to go offensive tackle at this, <laughs> at this spot in the last couple of days. I, I'm sure that Classic, you saw girl. it. Maybe, yeah, maybe not everyone saw it, but I'm sure you did. Um, Harbaugh harping on that the offensive line is the most important position group in the mm-hmm. league or in, in on any team and how, how important the offensive line is to him and how it makes sure that the entire rest of the offense can function. So, I mean, we, we shouldn't be shocked if Harbaugh goes tackle here, but um, there, there's still definitely a possibility to go receiver, but if they do end up going tackle there, um, they, the Chargers do hold pick 37, so that they're, there's a good chance that they grab a, a receiver there if they go tackle early on. Some of the names that are projected to go in that range that the Chargers could easily take advantage of are the, the Texas wide receivers, A.D. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, Lad mm-hmm. McConkey out of Georgia, Xavier Leggett out of um, South Carolina, Keon Coleman, FSU, and Troy Franklin out of Oregon. Those are all guys who are kind of projected to go in the first round uh, or second round that are all potential options um, for the chargers to go at pick 37. But um, when, when they do inevitably draft their wide receiver, what's available for them. I mean, you talked about the sheer number of raw targets that are available for a receiver in this offense. Um, Keon Allen, no longer in the picture, 31% target share, 148 raw targets last year. And he was that 10 yard a dot kind of the first read easy target role that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks which is so incredibly valuable and then mike williams no longer in the picture only played in three games last year but he's historically for that offense been the vertical x receiver role so whoever comes in is going to take on the wide receiver one role almost de facto especially if they select whoever it is with that uh, number five pick either neighbors or marvin harrison jr most likely but I will, I'll let you get into the, the Niner stuff more in, in a second, but what, what is that role really going to be worth? And I'm kind of concerned for it, but if it ends up being neighbors of Marvin Harrison Jr., you'll just have to follow the talent and be all right with it. But the Greg Roman wide receiver one role in Baltimore was not great. There was basically zero success for wide receivers in Baltimore during the time that Greg Roman was the offensive coordinator. But it's kind of comparing apples and oranges because the best receiver in in that Baltimore offense during that time was Mark Andrews, who's a tight end. That definitely will not be the case in Los Angeles this year. Um, It'll be someone it it won't be Donald Parham or whoever they end up adding. Um, But. The only wide receiver to crack a thousand yards under Greg Roman in Baltimore was um, Hollywood Brown in 2021. He had a thousand and eight receiving yards, I believe. So just a shade over a thousand in that season. He was the wide receiver 21 in points per game and the wide receiver 22 overall. So not great in terms of production. I mean, a, a quality flex in a low end wide receiver two on your fantasy teams. But yeah, historically, the at least um during his time in baltimore this, this wide receiver one role hasn't been great which has me a little nervous but if it is one of those top guys like i mentioned earlier i'm always going to be following the talent yeah my my concerns are, are certainly real as well with you given again 28th or lower in pass attempts nine to ten seasons seven or ten have been last or second to last still though this is an offense that top 11 in overall points 
in over 80% of Greg Roman's times calling plays. And it is something where there is great volume up for grabs here. And we've seen wide receivers, even though it's small, it's been very, very concentrated to one receiver, one tight end. And that's really it. So that's why Josh Palmer, sure, he looks like the guy right now. I don't know that I like his price tag, though. There's really never been a productive number two wide receiver other than one year where they had Crabtree and Bolden with the Niners. And Crabtree was okay and still not great there. But let's just quite quickly dive in to a few of these numbers. Vernon Davis in 2011 led the team with 95 targets, 67 catches, 762 yards, and six touchdowns. He, I shouldn't have said led it. He was second on the team to only Crabtree at 115 targets, 72 catches, 874 yards, and four touchdowns. So no receiver was really all that productive in 2011, but Vernon Davis did get it done. The next year, though, we did see Crabtree go up to 127 targets, 1,100 yards, nine touchdowns, 85 catches. And we saw Vernon Davis kind of hit a wall there, only 548 yards and five touchdowns on 41 catches. was also, again, second on the team. So it goes to show you really only one useful weapon in that season. But then the next one too we saw Vernon Davis call in a ridiculous 13 touchdowns 850 50 yards on 52 catches 84 targets while also Anquan Bolden did have 1179 yards seven touchdowns 85 catches and 129 targets and the next year Bolden also had another 130 targets 83 catches 1062 yards and five touchdowns so there is I do think there's room for one person at minimum to stand out and maybe if they do make an interesting tight end I know you said the tight end won't be the focal point of this offense but there is a chance they go Brock Bowers there at number five and then suddenly we're looking at a I think I'd consider him a top six top seven fantasy tight end if he did land there as the Greg Roman move around Vernon Davis Mark Andrews year in and year out we've seen a decent tight end that's why I do love Donald Parham as a last round stab for now because yeah they'll probably add somebody but Whoever it is, unless it's Bowers, probably will be in at least a committee there with Parham. So I think that makes him a great last round stab. Currently, we'll see who it ends up being. But yeah, it's neighbors. If it's Harrison, and even if it's a second round guy, I do think there is room to have a bold and light season because Justin Herbert is just that good. So 130 targets from Justin Herbert, even in a run centric attack. I'll take that all day as a nobody right now going to the top three rounds there. So I, I would love to see who ends up there. And I also would love to see who ends up with the Cardinals because we've seen Kyler Murray really sustain some nice wide receiver. One sure, of course, having a DeAndre Hopkins doesn't hurt that, but it seems very, very likely all the buzz is at number four. They're going to be going wide receiver, whether that's Marvin Harrison, whether that's Neighbors, whoever it is that they decide on is going to be walking into a very, very good spot. And you have some numbers on that. I have some numbers on it too, but why are you intrigued to see who lands with the Cardinals? Yeah. Uh, the first point I want to just make is I, there a lot of mocks uh, who, who knows what the, what's actually going to happen, but a lot of mocks have them trading out of that number four mm. slot and trading down. So they could easily end up with a uh, Odunze in the, in the later couple of picks in the middle of the first mm -hmm. round or, um, or they could go with one of those late first, early second round guys that I mentioned earlier, if they do end up trading down. But um, as of now, I'm operating on the assumption that they're going to go receiver there at number four. But you never really know with those draft day trades. But let's take a look at what, what's available for whoever comes in as the wide receiver one um, in, in Arizona. So first off, who are they going to be competing with? And just to let you in on it, it's, it's not much. It's Trey mm -hmm. McBride, Greg Dorch, and Michael Wilson. And I mean, most NFL casuals probably haven't even heard, maybe not even heard of Trey McBride. Like it, it's the, these names aren't really ones that pop off the page. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Trey McBride personally, but the, these are a bunch of unknown names to the casual NFL fan. And there, there's a lot of opportunity for someone to come in here and take over. So 2023 was a bit of an anomaly in terms of how the, um, how the Cardinals passing game worked. So first off, we have Kyler starting off the year on the, injured reserve and he doesn't come back until midway through the year then hollywood brown their um, top wide receiver he was underperforming throughout the year and dealing with a heel issue throughout the year that kept him off the field and hampered his performance while he was on the field mm -hmm. and that led to trey mcbride being the primary target down the stretch after zach Ertz went down so all around an unusual passing game um passing attack and for arizona last year but to go back to 2022 when um Kyler Murray had a, a true wide receiver one in DeAndre Hopkins. Once again, Hopkins only played um, part of the season due to a suspension for PEDs, I believe it was. But uh, during the nine games that Murray and uh, Hopkins were on the field together, uh, Murray absolutely fed him as a true wide receiver one. 27% target share, 
seven of nine games with 10 or more targets wide receiver two or better. So wide receiver 24 weekly or better in seven of his nine games and 16.9 fantasy points per game, which was good enough for Hopkins to be the wide receiver nine in points per game on the year. So when he has that alpha receiver, like we would get with a Marvin Harrison Jr., we've seen Kyler Murray absolutely feed that guy and develop a really strong connection. And I really don't think a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to have a very hard time separating himself from Greg Dortch and Michael Wilson. So if Marvin Harrison comes in here as the wide receiver one with the fourth overall pick, I think it's a, that that's the jackpot landing spot for Marvin Harrison Jr. In my opinion, other than the possibly the chargers, those are the two obvious jackpot landing spots. But yeah, I I really think whoever comes in here, if, if it ends up being neighbors or Harrison with that fourth pick, they're going to separate themselves pretty easily and pretty quickly from those other options at receivers. And I expect them to take up a huge chunk of the target share and probably dominate pretty quickly. Yeah, wide receiver five, wide receiver 20, and wide receiver nine in points per game was DeAndre Hopkins. And again, I know it's DeAndre Hopkins. He's a stud, so we can't just completely say that, but we're, we're assuming a neighbors or a Marvin Harrison who at this stage of their careers will probably be better than the late stage DeAndre Hopkins. So there's absolutely top 10 wide receiver upside for whoever that number one guy is. They are fourth in the NFL in total vacated targets here with 217, nearly 40% of their share there. So a large, large portion there of the wide receiver, 59% of the wide receiver targets are up for grabs from last year's team. So plenty of value there for the Arizona Cardinals, especially if it's that number one guy again. And now there's a kind of a, a, in terms of honorable mentions, although I think one does kind of separate here, that is the Bengals, but just number twos in explosive offenses. Those were the two Chargers Cardinals, the teams I saw that have true number one vacancies who could be a guy that can walk in and see 140 targets from day one. That's available in those two offenses. That's not going to happen in any of the teams we go into here because they're just, they already have clear number ones, but still so explosive that there can absolutely be quality number twos. And what I'm going to shout out is the Bengals second in vacated targets. Now this would of course depend on a T Higgins trade. If they don't trade T Higgins short number three in the Bengals offense, we've seen Tyler Boyd produce some consistent value as a, a low end wide receiver fantasy three, but I don't know that we could expect much more than that, but assuming that maybe Higgins is gone, the Bengals would be vacating by far the second most targets in the league, nearly 300 of them, 47.5% of their targets would be up for grabs in that scenario. And that would be insanely valuable. So monitoring what the the Bengals do on draft day is going to be crucial. I also would love to see, of course, any of those top 10 overall offenses, if they add a clear number two, Teams that have some of those needs, the Chiefs, Rasheed Rice, Travis Kelsey, yes. But after them, yeah, I do love Concrete Brown. So maybe they are done adding. They've made some moves this offseason, but there is still room for a yet another mouth to be fed. But I especially think the Bills, sure, we know Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, both of them seem like number threes to me. If the Bills decide round one, let's go with A.D. Mitchell, I see no reason why he wouldn't be the clear number two to Stephon Diggs with the upside to maybe overtake Diggs after what we saw last year. Cowboys, yeah, Brandon Cooks is the number two, but Gav- Caleb's gone. Cooks is another year older. The Texans, Tank Dell, Nico are awesome, but we saw them deal with injuries. We saw Noah Brown go for over 200 yards on two occasions last year. So there is room for a third to step into there. And maybe my favorite is the Lions. Reynolds is now gone and they kind of rotated all year. Maybe Jamo ends up stepping up and being that guy. But if not, there's definitely room for the Lions to add another big bodied receiver. So of those offenses, we got the Lions, Chiefs, Bills, Bengals, Cowboys, Texans. I don't know if I'm forgetting any that you want to shout out as well, Mo. Do any of those catch your ear before we move on to the quarterbacks? Yeah, the two that I'm particularly interested in are the Bengals and the Bills. So for the Bengals mm-hmm. right now, the way their roster is set up, they don't really have a guy who's locked in to be running routes out of the slot in their three wide receiver sets. So they have um, Charlie Jones, who was primarily used on special teams last year. He doesn't do it for me. I, I think he'll be a, a lifelong backup, and uh, he, he's, a, he's a solid piece to have on special teams, but he's not looking like he's going to be or be a value at the slot for the Bengals. And then they have Mike Gesicki, who played out of the slot uh, a fair amount for the Patriots and for the, for the Dolphins, but they don't really have a, a guy who's locked in to take up the majority of those, of those routes. So 
I won't be super interested if they add a guy in the draft who projects to be more of an outside guy or profiles to be more of an outside guy. But if the guy that they end up selecting is a slot receiver, that's where I'll be interested in picking up that guy because I don't think that there's a lot of competitions for, competition for routes out of the slot in Cincinnati. And then the other one I'm interested in is um, – is uh, Buffalo with um, Curtis Samuel. So like you said, there, there's a very clear path for the Bills to add a guy late in the first round as a receiver, like an A.D. Mitchell, as you mentioned. And if that is what happens, um, I, I'll be very excited as that guy for the number two option for Josh Allen. But if that doesn't happen, which I think is a very realistic possibility, it's looking like we're going to have a competition between uh, Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir and I, I, I like Curtis Samuel there to, to beat out Khalil mm -hmm. Shakir as the number two. And even if uh, another guy is added, I prefer Curtis Samuel to Khalil Shakir to take those slot routes. And uh, Curtis Samuel has shown the ability to run successfully run routes out of the slot and on the outside. So if he, if he can avoid the landmines in the drafts in the draft and be locked in as the number two guy there, it's great. But even if he does, if even if the Bills do add in the draft, I think Curtis Samuel can pretty easily beat out Khalil Shakir and I'll run all the, not all the slot routes, but a great chunk of the slot routes. So Curtis Samuel's um, someone I'm definitely interested in, and I'm I'm not over drafting him crazily right now. But if he can avoid those those landmines in the back of the first round, like those A.D. Mitchells and some of those bigger guys, Xavier Leggett, if he can avoid those, that's someone I'm going to be really looking to lock in as a target on draft boards for me. Yeah, we talked about Curtis Samuel a few weeks ago on our part two free agency. And don't forget, Joe Brady was his offensive coordinator for his career year there in Carolina. He had over 40 carries, had the second most opportunities per game among wide receivers that year and was a top 17 wide receiver in fantasy. So I think even if they do add somebody, there's going to be a role. Joe Brady went out and got his guy again. And, and again, yes, slot, yes, outside, but also in the backfield. Joe Brady really liked to use him. He had the most third down receptions to move the chains that year as well. So there's definitely a role for Curtis Samuel, regardless of what they do, but certainly would be more intriguing if he avoids a landmine. And you talked about slot going to the Bengals. I mean, if Ladd McConkey ends up there, he is going to be deadly wherever he goes in the slot. But if Jamar Chase and T are on the outsides and he just gets all that room to operate, no one's going to be able to guard him. I, I would love, that would be a deadly offense if they can get someone like Ladd in there. Whew. That would be dangerous. Now, we're going to wrap up with some quarterback value holes. This is usually the scarcest of value holes. There's not very often positions at quarterback where there's an opening that somebody would step in and immediately be a top 15 guy. Most of those are already filled at this stage of the offseason. And similar to the wide receiver questions, not like the Patriots. Yes, we know they need a quarterback. Do I trust that guy to be an actual valuable fantasy quarterback? Probably not. I do like Alex Van Pelt, so we'll see what they do before I keep dumping on them. But guys that we are actually interested in, certainly for me, the Vikings, maybe the Broncos because of Sean Payton, but let's just quickly look at the Vikings. You got Justin Jefferson. You got TJ Hawkinson when he's healthy. Now Aaron Jones is there. Jordan Addison, what an explosive number two. And then, of course, Kevin O'Connell, who's been well above the league average in pass rate over expectation, top five in pass attempts over his years with the Vikings over the, uh, since he joined there three years ago. And we've seen like Nick Mullins be a top six fantasy quarterback in points per game in this system. Josh Dobbs was going nuts for a stretch there. So I really, even if it's Sam Darnold next year, which I don't expect it to be, I think they're going to trade up. They want Drake May, their quarterback coach, came from North Carolina. There's a lot of dot connecting that makes a lot of sense. I do think that's going to end up happening. I think Drake May is going to be a great value once it does happen. But even if it's not him, if it's Jaden Daniels, if it's J.J. McCarthy later in the draft, even if it's just Sam Darnold, somebody's going to be a potential top 20 quarterback for the Vikings, given the weapons, given the play calling. It is the best quarterback value hole. Honestly, I've seen in the last few years, you typically don't get something like this. So I'm very intrigued to see who lands with the Vikings. What are your thoughts? I mean, yeah, it's going to be great no matter who it is. I mean, last year, Kevin O'Connell had people calling jo Josh Dobbs the pastronaut because <laughs> just like because of what an internship he did at NASA. But like people were freaking out about Josh Dobbs, this guy who had been a career backup up until that point, thinking he was the answer and he was the truth. And obviously that came crashing and burning. And if you had any sense of what was going on, you kind of could see that coming that Josh Dobbs was not the answer <laughs> in Minnesota. But I mean, yeah, it, he, he took Nick Mullins to, to have some great production down the stretch last year. So regardless of who it is, I mean, 
obviously rookie quarterbacks are typically the they're a little slower to come around but no matter who it is I, i'm going to be interested regardless and if it is drake may good god like his adp is gonna just skyrocket i already think mm-hmm. I already think that it's a little too low to begin with. And I think that's just because a lot, most people expect him to go to new England. But mm-hmm. I mean, if he ends up in, in Minnesota, the sky's the limit fantasy wise. Um, when, when it comes to the Broncos, I'm not really interested whatsoever. Um, yeah. That, that offense is kind of horrifying. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to take a, I'm starting to be interested in Javante Williams. Um, but that's really the only piece of this offense that I see myself investing heavily in um, during this off season. And I don't even want to say heavily, but investing yeah. <laughs> in really at all. I mean, yeah, the, the, the needle isn't really moved for me by the Broncos and whoever ends up there. And for the Pats uh, as of now, it's looking like Drake may. And even if Drake may is um, does end up in new England, I still think his price is too low. It'll come up um, no matter what we've talked about this a little bit here and there that, the rookies prices will come up regardless just because there's some clarity on where they're ending up. Mm -hmm. But even if he ends up in, um, in new England, I I still think he's a value. He was going in the uh, going behind Justin Fields when I last looked at the ADP the other day. So that doesn't really make sense to me. I mean, he's a guy who's all but locked up to start all 17 games next year. So I don't know. As of now, the price is a little too low and it'll change almost. It'll 100 percent change depending on or when when he lands in the NFL draft. But if he ends up in in Minnesota, uh, that that will be someone that we will be talking about pretty consistently throughout the offseason. 100 percent. That wraps up our value holes. A lot of the dream scenarios who we'd love to see fit those value holes and and sneak in there. So let us know, Wolfpack, again, what you think of there. I'm going to pull in. Our draft here, where we I just joined in. We need three more people. So hey, if you're watching there, we got over 100, almost 150 of you there, largely on Twitter. Come join in, come draft with us, see what you got. But also, please get some questions. And you got keeper leagues, you got dynasty drafts coming up, rookie drafts, whatever questions are on your mind, fantasy wise, or if you disagree with some of these value holes we've listed and you want to talk about some others that you think we missed, we'd be happy to discuss these things. But we will definitely be keeping our eyes peeled on many of these things. What would be your ideal as we're waiting for this one to fill up? We got two more spots here. Who's your ideal to see go to the Cowboys at this point of the season? Um, definitely, it's definitely got to be one of those rookies, and I want to just say Trey Benson because the uh, the knee the knee injury in recovery from Jonathan Brooks is uh, just in terms of talent, everyone seems to think they're pretty on par um, given the knee injury to Brooks. So I, I'm just going to lean Benson because because of the uh, injury recovery. And he, they're saying that he'll be ready by camp, but you never really know. So the, the opinion will definitely be more solidified when once we start getting some true reports out of mini camps and whatnot in the next couple of months. But for now, I want to say Trey Benson. But to be honest, I, it, it doesn't really matter to me. And I, I don't mind, even if it's Rico Dowdle, they've proved that they can just produce running backs no matter who it is. I mean, I, I rattle off the names who have finished as top 15 running backs for the Cowboys in the last 10 years. And they, I mean, toward, even towards the end of Zeke's stand or time in, uh, in Dallas, I mean, he was kind of a dust ball and he was just still getting it done no matter what. So, and we're with the 101 on the clock here. Do you go uh, Lamb or McCaffrey here? I go, I go CMC myself and I've gotten the one pick quite a few times, but I can't pass up CMC. Yeah. Do you feel any differently? No. No, the, yeah, the yeah. positional value is just ridiculous. And yeah, he, he, if he stays healthy, he'll finish on par with whoever the wide receiver one is at the end of the season, uh, not, whether it is Lamb, Hill, or some other guy. I think as long as CMC stays healthy, he'll finish on par with the top receivers and he should, he would finish eons ahead of the guy who's the, the running back too. So yeah, I, I'm going uh, McCaffrey at the, the one-on-one. It's always, it's always hard when you're, when you're clicking a, a running back of his age and consistent usage over the years. So it, but it, 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 there's just really no, no argument in my opinion for why you're not going McCaffrey at the one one No, it's, it's the Kyle Shanahan scheme. It's already beautiful for nobody's. And we've seen what McCaffrey can do in a full season there last year it was beautiful. And I get that the touch totals and all that, but that's one thing that I love about Shanahan. He gets McCaffrey out in space. It's not all taking these hard hits and, 
McCaffrey talked a lot last year how he met with Marshall Falk and talked about how do you preserve yourself? How do you avoid those injuries? And he talked a lot about how Falk said you don't have to be a hero every single play. Get out of bounds. Go down if a bunch of people are coming at you because that's often when you take those hits is when you've been stood up and people dive at your legs. And He said yeah, don't be a hero every play. And we saw McCaffrey preserve himself last year quite well throughout the entire season. No nicks, no real issues there. He only got rested when they had already locked up their spot. So I, I, yeah, I'm with you. I see it's only injury. And of course there's always a risk, especially when a running backs getting that age. I do not worry about the age this year. I do not worry about anything other than if he got hurt and we could play that game with everybody. So long that McCaffrey stays healthy, he's going to be the best running back in fantasy. And like you said, probably by a long shot. Now I do think this year, there could be some guys nipping at his heels a little bit closer than we saw last year. Bijan going at three, one of them. Brees Hall going there at seven, another one. It's one of the, the few years in uh, recent memory that we've had these really young three-down threats in offenses that are, uh, you think at least, ascending with Rodgers returning to the Jets, ideally this year, with Kirk Cousins coming to the Falcons. I do think those guys will be nipping at McCaffrey's heels this year, and we could see a, a real injection of some young talent at the position. Kyron Williams also last year, the volume that he saw. Uh, who do you think is the number two running back behind McCaffrey? I, I was about to ask you a similar question. I, I, to me, it's it's Bijan Robinson, but I'm working. I'm I'm the question that I'm asking is: Am, am I comfortable with him settling in ahead of Tyreek Hill and Jamar Chase no. and some of these elite receivers? And I'm having a hard time justifying it to myself. I, I I've talked about it at length that I'm just nervous about the steam behind these Atlanta guys, and we're we're seeing it firsthand here in the last two drafts that we've done together. Uh, B. John Robinson goes ahead of those other elite receivers. So I, it, it, it's too high of a price to me. Are you comfortable grabbing Bijan at the third overall pick? Because it's looking more and more likely, like it's not just these random drafts that he's going ahead of these receivers. It's looking more and more likely that he settles in as a top three, four pick. Yeah. I've seen it often too. I would never take him above lamb or Hill. Once you get to chase, which I'd still probably side with chase six out of 10 drafts. But I could I can make the case for Bijan. He, he now gets the play caller that rode Kyron Williams like no other last year. And I know McVay was the real play caller, but Zach Robinson part of that that offense for so long. So I, I see Bijan those usage questions likely getting tossed out the window. The offensive worry questions, as long as Kirk Cousins is healthy, definitely getting tossed out the window. I, I really could see a massive, massive. He's already talked about two thousand yards rushing being his goal. I have, I'll, I'll admit it, there's been a couple drafts I've snuck in Bijan at four ahead of Jamar Chase just because I had gotten a few Jamar Chases already this offseason. And I'm intrigued to get Bijan, but I was getting him at like 10, 11 just a, a month or two ago before Kirk got there. So I have some shares already. Most likely I'm going to be going Tyreek, CD, definitely those two, and, and probably Chase over Bijan too. But once I get to five, I, yeah, I, I think I, I'm with you one that Bijan's definitely my number two. After McCaffrey, a lot of people do have Brees Hall there, and understandably so. But Bijan is my number two running back, and I could see myself taking him above Amon Ra, above Jefferson, until we know who the QB is as well. Um, I, I'm there. I, I'm ready to do that as well. Um, is there anybody going? We, we haven't really talked about, like, busts yet. Um, much. Oh, perfect. Is there, yeah, perfect. is there anybody going in these early rounds, these first two rounds? That you're hating. <laughs> I cannot wait all summer long to pound my fists about how much I do not want to draft Jonathan Taylor. And <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's definitely going to be Jonathan Taylor for me. I just, I mean, here he he's going at tw at the 12th pick, and uh, I've got your best ball rankings pulled up. You're you're in the same wheelhouse as me. You've got him at 20th overall. Yeah, and I, I, I'm more comfortable with him at that two three turn area. Um, me, yeah, a late second round, I, I wouldn't mind it, but. Holy, holy crap, I, I don't understand the, the late first round, early second round price at all. I mean, he, he's never historically never really been an efficient or highly utilized player in the passing game. He, he, his touchdown equity is going down the toilet with Anthony Richardson coming back. And I, I, I just don't get it at all. Like he, he's been okay in terms of efficiency um, in, the, in recent history um, as a rusher, but I just don't see the usage as a receiver. I don't see the work at the goal line. And I, I, I just don't – how are people justifying themselves with this, with this first-round capital? I mean, can, can you formulate any sort of explanation as to why people think he's worth a first-round pick? 
I just don't see it whatsoever. Like I get, he has an RB one season under his belt, but like, it's a completely different situation than what it was when he, that was 2021. Yeah. And, and I, it's just so hard for me to wrap my mind around this price. And as of now, I'm just getting none of them, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hear your opinion on that after we make this pick. It's hard for me to not go with the Diggs Allen stack here. I like it. I'm, I'm there with you. I'm happy to do it. I do love Debo as well. If you, you have a Debo CMC, you go Brock later. Um, I wouldn't hate going like Diggs Samuel or even Debo, uh, Debo Evans as well, but you think we go Davis? I mean, Allen and Diggs and just lock yeah, them yeah. up. All righty, all righty. I like it too. We already have Diggs going right there with the auto pick, and I'll I'll just sneak Allen on in there as well. I, I'm all about it. Um, just to just summarize that pick, and I know we were texting about this earlier in the week. Anytime I've seen Josh Allen round three, I've hit it and I've set and forget over 400 fantasy points three straight years. QB one three straight years. You know exactly what you're getting, again, assuming health, and and I want to assume health for everybody. And so locking him and CMC up together is a yeah. no-brainer. You know exactly what you're getting in those two spots. And then you can – I and just in general, I do really like getting an early quarterback, oftentimes an early tight end as well, so then I can kind of pick and choose where I do that. That's just a general philosophy. I'm trying to, like, fill out a, a kind of a starting lineup within my first 10 picks. So then it's all about value and whatnot with the, the second half of the draft. It, I don't force it if there's receivers falling that I love. Uh, I'll go five straight receivers sometimes, sure. But in general, I have liked getting those builds where I, I fill out a, a real starting roster for those first eight guys and then figure it out from there. And and I love stacking Diggs, Allen. I, I've got a, a start to this this draft I've started many a times with Diggs, uh, Allen, and CMC. Whenever I have the one pick, it seems like that's what I always end up doing. And I'm okay with it uh, by all means. Um, so yeah, I, I'm happy about this. W- yeah. What are your what are your takeaways with the Allen Diggs combo? Here? I mean, like you said, I this year throughout the offseason, I will be probably be grabbing Allen in the third round anytime he gets there to me. And the 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 tweet that I sent you that sparked our little conversation about Allen, he's had four straight seasons that have been a top ten fantasy quarterback performance of all time. Not yeah. just he hasn't been a top ten quarterback in four straight seasons. He's Man. had four consecutive seasons where he's put up a top ten finish all time in terms of fantasy performance. So, I mean, he, he should be miles ahead of any other quarterback. I mean, you've got the questions about Hertz in terms of um, just that offense, not looking great down the stretch last year. And I don't, this is partially like wish casting and not, not necessarily wish casting, but just grabbing at straws. Like who knows what the status of the tush push is without um, Jason Kelsey under center. They, they, they have already ruled that they're not. Oh, I, okay. With Kelsey there. Yes. I agree with yeah. you there. I just wanted to make sure because some people were worried that it was just going to get overruled. No, no, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it, it did. Get, it's still legal, which is just still ridiculous. Yeah. Even a conversation, like, stop it! Don't make it illegal. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. But yes, continue. Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, even if even if they still try to do it, I mean, who knows about the effectiveness of it without Kelsey? I mean, he's obviously played a massive role in the success of that play. So I mean, and then Mahomes last year, I, I pounded my fist on the table saying this is arguably the worst pick in drafts with him going at the end of the first round, early second. So um, I'm, I was glad to be right there. So I think Allen, after last year, has clearly separated himself as the answer, as the elite um, quarterback. So I, I'm grabbing him uh, everywhere I can in the third round. And I don't mind taking him in the back half of the second round either. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I, I text you too. I take him every time he's in round three, and, and I've largely held true to that as well. I've even seen him. Yeah, yeah. Especially with the, how the ADPs are setting up right now, it's so easy to get a stack off with digs too. So it, it's I just know. all the more reason to to do it when you have an early pick in these drafts. I know, and and Diggs, he does – you can't not be worried about that pretty pathetic finish we saw yeah. from Diggs. Horrible. But- he was going seven overall, even top five overall in some of these best ball drafts last year. And there's a real chance Diggs ends up, you know, being the guy again um, and, and figures himself out. So I, I don't mind Diggs. That's the stage I, I really am happy to take a stab on him rebounding back to the Diggs we've seen the last four years there. Um, I, I know you were asking about Jonathan Taylor, and I'm with you. I definitely think he is one of the guys uh, I am avoiding in these early rounds. To see him go above Kyron Williams, Jameer Gibbs, it makes no sense to me at all. And and I get it. Two years ago, the consensus number one pick, you couldn't do anything other than draft Jonathan Taylor, maybe CMC at the top of drafts. And he kind of earned that. He, he was the running back five as a rookie, the running back one the next year. And then he was the running back 32 and 33. And I know there's injuries and I know he's been hurt. I also get that Zach Moss is gone and that's a 
huge bugaboo. I love this Shane Steichen offense that runs a ton of plays. They're going to definitely run the rock a ton. Anthony Richardson there at QB, try to protect their number one pick. But that's another reason I don't love Taylor is Richardson's a Cam Newton, but faster. He's going to get a ton of that goal line volume as well. So it does remain to be seen. What do they do with back? Because if they make minimal moves in the draft, Trey Sermon's right now the number two back behind Taylor. So I get it in that sense, but he didn't – I just haven't seen him pop like he did a couple of years ago in that 2021 season. He's always had something nagging and hasn't really fully looked like himself. I get it. I can certainly understand why people want to take a rebound on Josh, uh, uh, Jonathan Taylor. He's been uh, getting entered the league absolutely it's, smashing, but it's, it's, it's not it's even really buying hard. a rebound. Yeah, yeah. Paying a top two round price, a top 15 pick for him. It's like you're not even buying him off a downy. I, 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 I could scream about this all afternoon long. I, I just, <laughs> I, I can't, I, I can't wrap my head around it. But um, coming up with our next pick, we'll be on the clock here in a couple picks. I like you mentioned earlier, some of these, some of these, I don't know why some of these elite tight ends are slipping down in the mid rounds. I, I know last week you talked about a little bit about um, Jake Ferguson in the later rounds, but with guys like uh, Trey McBride and Mark Andrews slipping to us here mm-hmm. in the, in the fourth round, I mean, it, it yeah, I don't. I don't get the the Laporta tight end one going in the third round. Personally, I, I I can see the argument. I I'm not really I'm not backing that argument. But I, I know you said you're a huge fan of grabbing tight ends here, and I I think that's the route that we go. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely down for McBride for Andrews. Uh, I'm fully there with you. The only thing I would consider is oftentimes I've seen um, Kittle make his way back at the end of the next rounds, and that would kind of give us that stack, but. I'm with you. I'm happy to go Trey McBride. We do only have one receiver though. And I do like Rome. I like Zay a a lot. So I'm not opposed to going to receivers here either. Would you really want to lock up Trey McBride or would you be opposed to going to receivers? Let's go Rome here. Cause I think we have to absolutely grab a receiver here at some point. Yeah. Um, I, I, I prefer McBride to flowers and and that's just my preference. I know. I do too. I have a good feeling that that Kittle will fall to us. Yeah, I've got, I, I'm fine to play that game and grab a receiver here. Yeah, it's just how thin the receivers often will get. Yeah. I, I'm with you though. I, I get the Trey McBride love at this pick. I am 100% with you in terms of like Laporta going 20 picks ahead of him. Makes no sense to me. You want to argue that Laporta is the number one tight end? Yeah, I, I can buy that, sure. But to be the number one tight end going two rounds, Ahead of a Trey yeah. McBride, who could easily outscore him. Ahead exactly. of Mark Andrews, yeah, that that makes no sense to me. That, um, like going back to what yeah. I was talking about with Mahomes last year, like my argument in the offseason, like why is he going a round and a half ahead of these other guys? And like they have similar likelihoods to finish as the tight end one. Like in in Mahomes' case last year, like the quarterback one, he was going a round and a half ahead of yeah. some of these guys. Like uh, Allen, not not a, not really a, a round and a half for Allen and Hurts, but significantly ahead of some other guys. And for the case with Laporta, I don't like he's being drafted. Like he's he's got like by far the best chance to finish as the tight end one, and I just don't think that's the case. No, not not at least two rounds better than McBride. No. A round better than Kelsey. Not even uh, Andrews close. hasn't even gone yet. So I'm with you, and I, I would. It, in a vacuum, I probably would take Laporta number one, but yeah. in the exact same round as these guys. So Actually, I'm with you. I, I think a lot of it, and I bet in redraft we're not going to see that quite as much. I think a lot of it, yeah, in, in this case you see St. Brown getting stacked with Laporta. I've seen a lot of Gibbs and Laporta. It makes sense when te- people are trying to team stack in their best ball yeah. leagues. I, I get that, but he should be going more in this 43 range. There's a very real chance that they add a, you know, Xavier Leggett. Uh, a big body number two wide receiver. Now that Reynolds is likely gone, they make a splash at, in the first couple rounds at wide receiver. I, I love Laporta again. I'm not. This is not me trying to hate on Laporta, but there's a, a real chance that he's behind St. Brown, that he's behind another rookie receiver, behind Gibbs, fourth in the target totem pool. Uh, yeah, it's a good offense, and it can certainly sustain four miles, including Laporta, who's going to be a red zone beast, who's great after the catch. I love everything about Laporta. So I don't want this to be a down on Laporta. But yeah, I think it's about the relative cost as we've been emphasizing. He's definitely one of those first three round picks that I just, I only landed him my first time and it was on the team I texted you yesterday because uh, he went, you know, it, right where yeah. I've been getting Kelsey, like at 40. So once he fell to there, sure. Yeah, this is where I expect him to go. This is where I want him to go. Dan, there goes Kittle. I was hoping he'd make his way back to us. Uh, so we might be in the tight end weeds today. No we worries. Shall see. Uh, it could be ugly. But uh, we'll find out soon. 
Um, but yeah, I, I that's a, a great talking point. There is Laporta just going so much earlier, a, a full twelve picks ahead of Kelsey, a, a near twenty three picks ahead of Trey McBride, like almost two full rounds. No one should be shocked if McBride outscores Laporta, even if no. they get drafted Marvin Harris and a Malik Neighbors. Like that, absolutely within the realm of possibilities. And- Within that Lions offense, people are drafting Jamison Williams like he's the locked-in wide receiver too there. And he's going within the top 100 picks. And like you said, I, there's there's a very realistic chance that they add someone. But, I mean, at this point in Jamison Williams' career, like what has he done to prove Nothing. that he like, should be the locked-up wide receiver too? Like I get the being in love with the talent and stuff. And like I personally – like obviously I, I love the talent too. I mean, who who you can't hate on the talent of Jamison Williams, but – he he's done nothing to prove that he's the locked in wide receiver too. And I yeah, some of these some of these Detroit guys are just getting a little bit too far pushed up. Like I think the offense is gonna be great, but just relative to what you could get elsewhere, I yeah, I just I don't get it with some of these guys. No, no, not at all. Um yeah. <laughs> it, it it the best blurb we've got on Jamison Williams this offseason was he's gonna compete for a full time role. I mean yeah, you're yeah, a, like... a top ten pick in the NFL. The the fact that you're not locked into a full time role tells you everything Horrifying. you need to know. Um so yeah, we're we're getting close to our pick. I would like uh, to stack up Kincaid and Josh Allen. I would yep. love Brian Thomas to fall. There, of course, goes Kincaid right as we cue cue <laughs> him up. I'm sure Brian Thomas will go this pick right before us. Um, I'm trying to look at like who else I would even like here. I don't mind Hopkins, Godwin. I don't love Aaron Jones, honestly. I don't. Um, I, I like Aaron Jones as the player, but the Vikings' run game has continually proven to be broken since it got carried by the talent of Dalvin Cook. Man, watching all these tight ends fly off, I do, especially with Brian Thomas falling to us here. I do wish we went Trey McBride. Uh, but I, I think Brian Thomas is our lock. We we got to yeah. go him. This is too much of a fall for him. He's going to shoulder somebody, but then we can figure out what we want to do after. Um, do we go at running back or do we just wait and hope like a, a Najee Chubb Mostert falls to us on the next way back? I don't mind waiting for that clump and like me. Yeah, maybe even Connor falls, but I agree. Brian Thomas is the pick there. I don't Godwin mind. and Hopkins, maybe one of those two. I don't love yeah. them. I like Hopkins, honestly, a, a bit more than Godwin, I think. I, I like Hopkins. Yeah, he had a monster year. I get Calvin Ridley just got there, probably really the number one, but I think they're going to pass it a ton more there. And this does open up the later stack for my guy, Will Levis, who I absolutely yeah. love yeah. in the later rounds too. We're, we're only gonna uh, yeah, I think it's going to work pretty well. Uh, yeah, and we're only going one more quarterback. Mm-hmm. I don't mind we're just fully waiting on um, waiting on just getting Levis pretty late and stacking him with Hopkins. And maybe we grab a, a Chig later on because this is uh, going to be a messy tight end room. So. Yeah, I don't mind grabbing Hopkins there. It sets us up pretty well in the later rounds. Um, but yeah, I this like clump of running backs, that's why I don't mind waiting a little bit to grab one because I don't like, especially with us having back to back picks, I don't mind double tapping two of these guys. Like I like Warren, I like Javante Williams. I don't I don't wanna be drafting Najee, but it seems like he's gonna get um carries and we've talked about Mostert at length and how the gap between him and Achan um, is just far too massive. And I don't think we mentioned this earlier, but Mostert signed an extension. So it wasn't yeah. a big extension. It was only one more year, but that's a pretty clear vote of confidence from, from the coaching staff and the front office that he's going to be, um, he's going to be a part of this offense. And the only thing that will really get me off of Raheem Mostert is if they add like, a bruising back who can take away the goal line because obviously a chan is going to get his work in between the twenties just because they love getting him out in space and using him there. But we we've talked about it before, just the, as of now, the touchdown equity for, for most is just, it's phenomenal. And yeah. I, I don't, uh, a chan doesn't scare me at the goal line. Like, of like I said it before, of course, he's going to be in some of those goal line packages, but unless someone gets added, I, I, I love just, especially most of I love clicking him, but a lot of these running backs in this range, it's just, it sets you up so nicely to grab um, wide receivers in like rounds five through seven. And then just the, those rounds eight, nine, there's just, there's, I, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I can convince myself with so many of those running backs. I can too. I'm starting to see him. And we can see it in this draft too. Like most are crept up to 83. You know, we'll see who ends up falling back to us. Cause 
earlier in drafts, you were getting Mosher every time at 96. You were yeah. likely getting a James Conner, a Najee. Somebody was falling to you here that you could go bang, bang. Uh, we'll see what ends up happening. I, they are starting to creep up in price. Mixon was often available before he signed with Houston in that range as well. This is why I do, though, love going Christian McCaffrey. We know we have our number one running back every single week that as long as it's not a bye week, McCaffrey is going to be putting up 18 to 30 points. We have this locked in, and we just really need to find probably just one other, maybe two others that pan out big. I've often gone David Montgomery here. He he crept up to uh, 64, unfortunately, in this draft. You know, Kamara. Normally, there's a guy that I like enough in that 72 pick range, and again, it's often Montgomery or Kamara or, or Mixon. None of them fell to us, and I thought we might get a, a fair crack at – a Najee, a Chubb, a Moster. These guys are all going. There goes Najoku and Ferguson as well. So we'll see what we're swimming around in uh, in, in these next few picks. It could get pretty ugly at running back. Uh, but either way, we have McCaffrey. We hit on a couple rookies, and we are all set for our, our number two back. And with these five receivers, we're not going to often need more than two running backs in our lineup. I, I think this is a very interesting build, depending on what ends up falling back to us here. Yeah, we haven't really started. We haven't had the number one picks. So we haven't started with McCaffrey build. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I it's so easy to not sweat the sweat the running backs just because you know what you're getting with McCaffrey. I mean, I it, it was just a gimme twenty points every single week last week or last year. So I, I don't mind just almost. I don't want to say it's a punt, but it, just basically riding McCaffrey. It's it's a very viable strategy, and there's still some names here that I I don't mind at all. I mean. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't mind Williams. I don't mind Warren here. There's just, I feel like just in this rounds eight through 10, there's just a lot of running backs who I think could hit. And like, you can paint the picture pretty easily to where they do end up hitting. So just grabbing those mid round receivers, locking yourself up for a quality wide receiver core. It's just where I find myself going almost every single time. Yeah. And and as it's approaching us, uh, Javante goes, which is too bad. I don't see any tight end that's worth a, a stab this early at this point. So I think we're probably going two running backs unless you wanted to stack up Purdy and CMC. Um, I was hoping Warren was going to fall to us. That would have been an easy click. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Zach Moss. I've been landing him in nearly every draft, not the players, just the role of the lead back in Cincy. Um, big yep. fan of him. I don't hate Tajay Spears at this price. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to just go with Moss just because it's, it's clicking down and I think yeah. he's going to be a very viable number two. Um, I'll let you choose where you want to go with this next one, um, whether it's running yeah. back or some of these receivers are intriguing too. So Spears doesn't really do it for me. I'm going to, I'm going to just play the jackpot and go with Trey Benson and maybe he ends up in, uh, in Dallas. Cause yeah, yeah, I think, I think the way we're setting up, I, I don't mind double tapping on running backs here. And, um, with our, um, with us already having, um, McCaffrey on the roster and then going Zach Moss. I think Zach Moss is pretty locked up to have uh, a solid workload um, in the early stages of the, of the season this year. So hopefully the way that we're setting ourselves up, we'll have that consistency um, from McCaffrey throughout the year. We'll get Moss. Maybe he's uh, put is the, the workhorse throughout the year in Cincinnati, but at the worst case scenario, I think he's handling uh, the bulk of the carries early on in the year. And then Trey Benson comes on early or later on in the season, ideally, as we've seen from, um, running backs, rookie running backs year after year, they come on and they're uh, even like, even if they end up in not on, in not a great situation, like just on a bad team with not a lot of wins, like just they're, they're testing out their younger guys they're getting them the rock. And uh, I think just in terms of how we're setting up this roster to progress throughout the season, I, I like those two picks there running back. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, later on the Marshawn Lloyds, you talked about the, the Jalen Wrights, if they end up being the lightning, uh, Gus Edwards might make his way back to us. I don't mind those cheap, you know, Moss, Gus Edwards. They're kind of like the David Montgomery lights. And, and yeah. I do think Montgomery deserves that round two or so price tag ahead of them because we've seen him already do it. We saw Jamal Williams do it the year before. We know the Lions are going to have that goal line guy, but I don't see a ton of difference if Moss is going to be the go-to goal line guy. We talked about how much Joe Mixon vacated at the stripe. I see a very similar role. And in best ball, in season long, those guys can be a little bit maddening. If they don't score their touchdowns and you're they, you know, they're in your lineup, they might score three total points. It's like, 
damn it. Yeah. I, I, you know, you, you do want those three down backs that you know you're probably getting 10 to 15, even without a touchdown. But in best ball, those two touchdown weekly, you know, every day, every week has a shot to score multiple touchdowns. Even if they bust, you're, you're going to have somebody else plugging in there. And when they hit big, they're automatically in your lineup no matter what. So that maddening nature of the heavy touchdown guys, which again, Moss, Gus Edwards, uh, you can really fill those in pretty easily the back end of the draft. So we'll know we'll have our McCaffrey, and then whatever touchdown score ends up being the beast that week, great. We have our number two back. We got five receivers that any given week will, will be four of those five are probably going to be in our lineups, and then we'll take some flyers late that could, you know, the, you know my boy Demarcus Robinson putting up 18 every four weeks. He'll be in there somewhere. Uh, so, yeah, I, this one's shaping out to be pretty nice, especially if, we get the, the Cowboys running back right, whatever rookie running back that ends up being, if we end up hitting that jackpot, man, this team could really be off to the races. So despite taking McCaffrey early, I'm still down to keep taking stabs at rookie running backs, hoping we get that diamond in the rough that ends up with the Cowboys there. Uh, I typically, when I start McCaffrey, don't like to draft more than five running backs, but the way this one shook out where we went like McCaffrey and I didn't even touch a running back till till round eight, I'm okay getting to maybe six backs. Uh, we'll see how it plays out, but um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of this build. I, I think the the best way that we can set up this roster is, like you mentioned, just the consistency of McCaffrey and then finding those guys who look to be locked into those goal line roles like a Zach Moss. And I, I think we should definitely queue up Gus Edwards to to grab him um, a little bit later on. But, uh, I, like, yeah, mm-hmm. just getting that, that, that touchdown upside to – to pair with the consistency of McCaffrey. I think that's probably the best way to build around Christian McCaffrey and just every, just hope one of those guys just falls in for a touchdown. You get your, your 12 points if they only get one touchdown and you get your, your 20 points. If one of them ends up with two touchdowns in any given week. And I I think that's a great way to build around Christian McCaffrey. I know. And and as we're looking here, people, what's interesting too is, you know, we saw this running back surge in the round. Like the guys were like, okay, maybe they'll fall. The Mosterts, the Najes, the Chubbs. None of them ended up falling to us. But now we're looking at, you know, all these teams are pretty set at running back. And we're still seeing Tajay now slip, you know, nearly 20 picks past his ADP. Same with Brian Robinson. I Even though we have Moss, I'm not opposed to Chase Brown. We've seen injuries for Zach Moss throughout his time when he was in Buffalo, stayed healthy with Indy. But if he goes down and Chase Brown's now the clear number one, probably has a role anyways in this offense as an explosive pass catcher. You still have Gus Edwards. Um, you know, I don't love Chuba Hubbard, but man, like that's that's volume at the position. I, I I'm a, I'm not opposed to adding at least one more back here. I was I was hoping it would be Jonathan Brooks. So then we have two of the the top two rookie running backs here. But I I have no issue with two running backs again. I do love Lad McConkey though, um, and I like Curtis Samuel a lot. So it might be tough to go too far. I still don't think we have to go tight end. Uh, with TJ Hawkinson now gone. I don't think Cole Komet with Gerald Everett there. I think we're going to probably look at like our last four picks or tight ends. And we just take four ugly stabs and hope that every week somebody's useful. Um, all right. It's our pick though. I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I like at least one running back and maybe lad or two running backs are possible uh, as well. For I, me. I like lad. I, I, I would like to go lad here with along with the running back. Um, okay, we'll, one, we'll get Lad, and then we'll figure out what back we want. Because I, I, I'm with you. I love Lad. I, just dreaming of him in a Bengals uniform now whew, would be beautiful. What do you think between Brian Robinson, Chase Brown, and Gus Edwards? I don't think Chu was in this combo. For me, it's either Brian Robinson or Gus Edwards, given how we've set this team up. But uh, yeah, I, I'll leave that up to you about personal or to make that pick. But um, I, I'm interested in Brian Robinson just because he. Uh, we're going Robinson here then. I right. like it. Yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to Robinson, like people want to talk about like Eckler coming in and taking away work from him, but I don't, what re, there's no receiving work to speak of when it comes to Brian Robinson in his last couple of his first two seasons in the NFL, he's gotten it done based purely on, um, on rushing work and touchdowns. And is, is Austin Eckler going to be taking away from him on the ground? Sure. Some, but I don't really think they brought Austin Eckler into carry the ball a bunch of day. He's going to be the guy on third downs. He'll be in there for some early down work, but Brian Robinson is still going to be, uh, end up with more carries than Austin Eckler. And there's, I mean, when it comes to goal line carries, um, I, I think it'll be Brian Robinson. I, I think Austin Eckler will get goal line work just because of his skills as a pass catcher. But when it comes to the got to punch it in from the one or two yard line, it's 
almost guaranteed to be Brian Robinson. So with with the workload that he has had in the last few years, he's consistently been a top 24 running back in terms of his output. So I don't know, I just grabbing him in the later rounds. And like like I said, I think he fits how we've set this roster up really well. Like he can easily end up with a with a with a touchdown and a two touchdown games here or there and just plug him in next to McCaffrey when he has those touchdown weeks. I mean, I, I, with with an eleventh round price tag, I, I I don't mind Brian Robinson at all, given that we saw him produce as a startable running back last year with minimal receiving work. Yeah, I I'm with you for for ninety percent of that narrative. The only issue I could see is Eckler does have a very good track record at the goal line as well. Yeah, yeah. And it was smaller and it does, Brian Robinson is built for the work better, but we've seen Eckler have you know what was it 18, 19, and twenty touchdown was, season like back to back back. Great 20, 20 touchdown seasons. Like yeah, he can do it. I mean, absolutely yeah, can. I guess yeah that he, he can. I I wonder what his success rate at the goal line last year. I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that number in front of me, but um, he definitely took a step back last year. And like you mentioned, it Robinson. Robinson profiles to be the guy at the goal line. And I, that, that is ultimately what will make or break Brian Robinson as a draft pick is, is if he's able to maintain that goal line role throughout the season. And personally, I'm willing to make that bet at the, at the current price. I am too. I, I mean, I, we went more Robinson for a reason. I, I do think that there, there was a midway through the season, he was the running back three in fantasy and a lot of people did the, not be John Robinson, but Brian Robinson, yeah. Robinson is the one that you wanted to draft. Uh, ultimately, and he, he's just a good, efficient, hard nosed. After a year after getting shot, you know, having such a ridiculously successful season, I'm a fan. I do worry, you know, that that maybe Eckler is more than just a receiving vulture. Could be a goal line vulture, and that would nip this pick a little bit. And and part of me is like Gus versus Robinson. If we're looking strictly for touchdowns, maybe I do prefer Gus, but I do like the ADP discount. I like Brian Robinson. Um, just as such a pure runner, Anthony Lynn's now the running back coach with, yes, he has the history with Austin Eckler, but even still, you know, he gets the best out of his running backs. Eckler's already said he wants to have that Melvin Gordon style role back to wear down the defenses and let him do his thing as an explosive compliment. So he kind of already understands I, I, I'm going to be seeding most of this work to Brian Robinson. It all depends on, you know, who ends up being that quarterback, how confident this offense ends up being, but Robinson finishing as a top 18 running back with Sam Howell at QB. I can't see it being worse than that. It's just a matter of how involved is Eckler, who is, yes, a good touchdown score. So if he is dangerously involved and they're like splitting the goal line work, I won't love this pick. Um, but even at 120, I mean, we're <laughs> even if he doesn't hit a ceiling, that's still yeah, a, that's, a pretty nice value. <laughs> with, with the price, yeah, it's it's fine. Even if if he's a total zero at the goal line, it's going to be a, a terrible pick. But I, I just don't see that being the case. No, how, how do you feel all. about Marvin Mims? He's one of those guys that I mentally am just going back and forth on. It seems like every couple of days, like I just <laughs> I can't make up my mind on him. Yeah, I I'm intrigued. So many big plays. I always reference the Scott Barrett tweet yep, about how eighty yep, percent exactly. of his big plays were of uh, the Broncos' big plays last year were Marvin Mims on like a twenty percent snap share. Peyton already said he's a guy that's going to get more work. It was tough to fit him in with Judy here. And now Judy's gone. So I really do like Marvin Mims. I don't know that I like him, though, more than Cook's Wicks. Uh, so I, I like both those receivers ahead of him. Uh, my pick I am a fan, though. Yeah, what do you think? My pick here is easily Cook's. The the question marks surrounding the pecking order in Green Bay and the inconsistency and unknown about the role for um, Mims is it's pretty easy for me to go Cook's. Just like the pass rate in uh, Dallas and just the, the touchdown upside, just the high scoring offense got to go cooks there. But uh, I want to say, let's go Drake may here. Uh, what, what, what are your thinking? It, we, we already have, uh, I'm going to uncue. I'm going to go Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, just that, that lightning running back type of injection yeah. here. Cause again, behind McCaffrey, it is still question marks between, yeah, I think it's going to be Moss, but maybe not Brian Robinson. We just poked some holes and him, who knows where Benson lands? We could, that could be a situation where the Pats draft Benson, and now it's like Rama. It could end up hideous. So I think I still like taking some stabs at rookies. I'd say maybe one more rookie, whether it's Braylon Allen, Audric, uh, Estime, whoever ends up being. I want to get one more stab at that Cowboys running back gold mine. It's still worth it, um, only because we we already have Allen and we we have Zach. Uh, I mean, uh, Will Levis. You know, with the DeAndre Hopkins stack later. Uh, waiting in the wings. So 
I, I'm okay passing up on May for now. If we had only had like, let's call it uh I'm trying to think of like maybe Brock Purdy. Let's say we, we talked about that strategy of, of passing on Allen, going Debo Samuel, uh, and, and we had Brock Purdy here. Okay, yeah, as much as I like Purdy, I think he's a nice safe option in round nine, but that's where you would want maybe that upside of Drake May landing with Minnesota and being a, a potential weekly top 10 QB. But even if if May lands in his best spot, it's still probably not enough to push out Josh Allen in like 85% of weeks. So it just doesn't give me much juice. Whereas Marshawn Lloyd, a 4 3 8 40, uh, he's got that juice to be a big play guy regardless of where he lands. And if it's with the Cowboys, boom, like we're, we're talking about a guy going around six in fantasy drafts. Oh, a yeah. Bit. Easily. So, yeah, yeah. I'm all about in these early drafts. Like we talk about value holes and, and the one thing I'm going to keep taking stabs at is, can I get the guy that the Cowboys draft? I know they're probably going to sign Zeke. I still like drafting Zeke with a last round pick. And I still want the lightning, uh, whoever they end up going at rookie running back. So I, I think it's worth taking another stab. A lot of people think Marshawn Lloyd could be the number one back off the board too. I think it's Trey Benson, but if if Lloyd gets ended up drafted ahead of him, and again to Dallas of all teams, like we could see prices. Would be massive. Yeah, yeah, would be uh, massive. I, as, I like the pick there. As Wicks and Luke Musgrave go off the board, I, I I've been curious to get your opinion on the um on the Green Bay wide receiver room. They're based on like ADP. People are kind of assuming that there is an established pecking order here with um, Jaden Reed going fifty sixth overall. And yeah. then Christian Watson going nearly 30 picks after that, about 25 picks after that. And then Romeo Dobbs going another 15 picks later. And then Dontavian Wicks is a little bit buried, but there's like an as presumed pecking order in Green Bay. And I just, I don't really think that we saw enough last year of them all together on the field for their ADPs to be this drastically different because typically when there's like, we know that the offense is good, but we're not really sure how things are going to shake out. We we see the ADPs a little bit like lumped together. And just because of that's just kind of people are incredibly uncertain about, about how things are going to shake out. But here we're not really seeing that there's a pretty significant gap between at least a round between all four of these receivers. And in most cases, at least two rounds between the receivers. So what, what do you think of the people just kind of assuming that this is what that the how the target pie is going to be split up? Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's definitely an important one, too, given how well we saw Jordan yeah. Love come on at the end of last year. I, I don't think that was a fluke, especially because it continued on in the playoffs. I think he's for real. So I do think getting the right pass catchers there is going to be important. But I, I'm with you that it could be messier. I know um, Matthew Barry at his combine talk, he wrote about how after talking to Green Bay guys that it is going to be a more spread the well situation and people are maybe a little too high on uh, Jaden Reed because of that, given that it is going to be more of a rotation. But to me, I do think it's right that Jaden Reed, the clear number one here, just because we saw him go to the backfield. We saw him play the slot. We saw him go out wide. I think he's going to have a, an every down role, regardless of where he is on the field. And I love the fact that it's, you don't know where he's going to be on the field. The, the Debo Samuel type of role that everybody's always craving. And there's never going to be another quote unquote Debo, but he had a couple rushing touchdowns last year. So I do like as much as he's, 30 picks going ahead of right now, Christian Watson. I do think that's right. Watson is the big X factor. I mean, he was a third round pick last year. I, I had a ton of shares of him. I loved him as a rookie. He came on so strong for me. He had a span where he was the number two wide receiver in fantasy as a rookie for a five week span until Rogers froze him out because he ran the wrong route at the end of the year. But then he had the hamstrings and he's visiting with a specialist. And I, I do want pieces of it. I think the order that they go is right. The one that I've gotten the least of is probably Christian Watson, despite recognizing he has the upside to be better than Jaden Reed 30 picks later. I'm worried about the hamstrings. I'm worried that he can't put it together. I'm worried that he's seeing specialists and maybe they do help him out. Great. I hope they do. Uh, but but he's the one because he's going, you know, after I already have four to five receivers and I'm looking to get my James Connors and my my ugly running yeah, back there. He's going yeah. in that lump of running backs that we talked about liking. So getting, the yeah, my builds, I don't get them a lot. <laughs> yeah. So it, th that's one thing that one group positional group that I will definitely be having to keep an eye on because I think just the, the stuff that comes out of training camp will, uh, Oh, as we're on the clock here, uh, I, I, I don't mind Levis here. I don't mind Levis at all. I think we're definitely going to go him. John U. Smith was the other guy I wanted to queue up and he is now gone. Uh, so fortunate. 
I know. He's my favorite, favorite punt tight yeah. end. I, I love kicking him off with that. So I think we're going to go Levis. I, I, I'll let it kind of tick out while we figure out what else we want to do. I don't love much else here, so I do think it makes sense to get our number one tight end. Um, yeah. To me, it's not Kate Otten. I don't mind Hunter Henry just because we're probably getting a quarterback upgrade. We know yeah. Alex Van Pelt likes his tight ends. Like, especially I, in the I, red I zone. Especially yeah. in the red zone. With, and without Gesicki there anymore. Gesicki I mean, now wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we saw both of them have pretty high usage in the red zone just in terms of their raw targets. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but – uh, they, they, they love to use their tight ends in the red zone. And now it's just Henry there. And with us waiting this late to grab tight ends, I just think we're, we're looking for touchdown upside. And that's exactly what, what we're getting with Hunter Henry. So I don't mind the pick at all. He started the season. A lot of people forget this. I even forget it from time to time through the first three weeks. He was the number one tight end in fantasy. And I know yeah. the, the offense crumbled not long after there, but we've seen these glimpses from Hunter Henry plenty of times. We've seen huge spike weeks with multiple touchdowns. Uh, and right now, when you look at the receiving room, uh, is it still Demario Douglas Nothing. at the top of the chart? Like, yeah. I, I, I think Hunter Henry. If I miss, I oftentimes am finding myself going like Johnny Smith, Hunter Henry when I can uh, get both of them. If I'm punting yeah. the tight end position, I love both those guys. Johnny again being my favorite, speed and space. We we know he's a distant fourth to fifth on the, the depth chart, but man, like he he is the perfect type of we- weapon for. Uh, Mike McDaniel. So, so John, who is my favorite, that's going after pick like 150 to break into the top 10. But Hunter Henry is my next favorite pick. Uh, Isaiah Likely, who, who went recently, uh, he's the one that's like, if something happens to Andrews, then yeah, it's a no brainer. He's a top six tight end the rest of the year. So I, I like him as my number two tight end, but I don't love him as my number one guy because you are kind of playing the handcuff game at yeah. tight end with him. Um, and. You- it's tough to just debate between these tight ends, these late tight ends. I mean, given how we've already gone Levis, we're kind of locking ourselves into Oconquo, um late, just how this roster is. Maybe. Like, I don't know. I don't know about Oconquo. I, I, I'm not a chick guy, so I know it makes sense with the stack. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not going to lock him in just for the sake of the stack. You're fully out. Uh, I, kind of. Not really fully out. We'll see. I, I think it probably makes sense with our build. Um, I did want to point out what we're talking about tight end, like, Fryer Muth and Musgrave going here, it, whereas we took our stab on Lloyd. Like, we could have considered one of them, but, like, to get Hunter Henry 17, 18 picks, like, is there really – one, I prefer John who and Hunter Henry to both those guys, never mind with an 18-pick difference between them, especially Musgrave. Musgrave makes no sense to me. I, I get Fryer Muth as you – know, Arthur Smith loves his tight ends, and he, he's been a consistent valve for the last two years. So he makes some sense to me, but I still like Hunter Henry, honestly, better than both those guys who went – way earlier so to me like if you don't get one of the guys where i, I am kind of wishing we had gone is it's where i where i steered us away from uh mcbride here i think that would have been a nice nice piece but uh it once you get into these is. weeds you know once you get into these weeds what are we doing i, I don't need musgrave this early yeah Give me Johnny, I mean, you know <laughs> we, we just spent five minutes talking about how murky the how murky the offensive situation is in green bay yeah i mean Passing on Musgrave at that at this point seems pretty easy to me as yeah. well. But Kraft, Kraft scored more points than him, and he goes the tight end twenty nine. And not, I'm not like saying I love Kraft either, but he was playing. Once Musgrave was back, Kraft played more snaps. Once he got the role, he proved to be a better blocker, proved to be a more complete tight end, and he was on the field more often. I get Musgrave brings a little bit more more athleticism and juice, but Kraft's not this slouch either. He's not like a non athlete, so. Uh, if I'm going to Green Bay tight end, it's it's almost always Tucker Craft, and it's not very often that I go either of the guys. But but yeah. <laughs> Do you have any interest in uh, Gesicki at all? I mean, he's he's buried on the draft board, but I mean, really, really, the only argument you can make is that like he's in Cincinnati. Like that's the the only like bullish argument you can make for him. Um, and they they brought back Tanner Hudson, who came on a little bit last year, but. I'm I'm just uh, we're gonna have to grab someone else, and I'm just looking at the names that are available and just trying it's to make cases for some of them. It's it's really ugly. I feel like we've been cha- like not we fantasy in general has been chasing like the Bengals tight end. It's Burrow. It's gonna be a great one. So Irv Smith gets there. Great the year before. I, you you're a Bengals fan. You probably know the names. There's always someone that lands there, and everyone's like all hyped up about the athleticism now in this offense and. I just I, – I'll believe it when I see it. And I, I like Tanner Hudson, honestly. I thought he came on um, quite well there at the end of the year. Um, so, to me, maybe if he falls back to us at 203, like the next go-around, okay. I'm not overly interested right now. Um, 
I do really want to go. We talked about him at length last week. I like Audric Estime a lot. Uh, I know it was a pro day time, but to go up from a four seven one to a four five eight at his massive size, uh, put him like in the top ten percentile of Raz rather than being the bottom. Um, so I'm a big fan of him. I just love the tape. He's a beast. I like Conklin myself at tight end with Rogers. We've always seen Rogers big tight end guys, and even yeah. last year, you know, yeah. Do you like Conklin? Should I just that, click it and then we talk? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah, three three straight years of 87 targets too, which I find fascinating. Just on the dot, 87 targets for three years. But we get 87 targets from Aaron Rodgers this year. That's There's fine. definitely an eight to ten touchdown upside there. I like the Jay Tevy, uh the Sanders pick. You know, if he ends up being the Chargers tight end or wherever he goes, I, I do like getting Jatavian Sanders a lot too. But um, I, I'm good with the Conklin pick. We we need. Something a little more safe right now, uh, Kevin. We need somebody seeing targets, and we're probably going to get 87 targets uh, for Tyler Conklin, and, and I'm cool with that because he, he was okay even with Zach Wilson. So yeah, if, if we do get a healthy Rodgers, I think Conklin's going to go down as a, as a huge deal. There was a stat entering last year about how it was Conklin his first year with the Jets in games without Wilson. Like Everybody looked at Garrett Wilson and how, how good he was without Zach Wilson, and it was very true. But then, like, t- Tyler Conklin's numbers without Zach Wilson as, as his first year with the Jets was a, a top seven tight end. And so, I, I don't know. I, I, I know I, I, yeah, I, I like – this is why I don't hate punting tight end. I do like the I, – I, again, I, if we could go back, I would probably go Trey McBride over Zay Flowers I, I, or, or Rome, whichever one we choose. Um, but we're going to get three to four tight ends, and, I, and I'm feeling okay about Hunter Henry and Conklin. So, th- th- those are some of my favorite punts for sure. I was I was kind of upset that uh that Noah Fant landed in uh landed in Seattle and this might be just me be me grasping at the the straws of his athletic profile from whenever that whenever he was drafted like three four years ago but um I, I was hoping he would uh he would land in a better spot I was grabbing him early on like during pre free agency I was grabbing him as my late round tight end just hoping he would end up in a great landing spot but. Now that he's landed in Seattle, he's like fourth on the totem pole. It's just he's not great anymore. But I agree. There's there's some solid late round tight ends that I don't mind grabbing. But uh, and I think uh, I think that uh, Conklin, like yeah, like you said, Aaron Rodgers with his tight ends, they've he they 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 don't mind targeting them in the in the red zone. So and the the consistent uh, eighty seven targets. I mean, you're not really getting that anywhere else in these. Uh, in in this range of tight ends so like like i said last week just finding consistency and red zone usage is nice but especially consistency in this range of tight ends is really what you're looking for yeah absolutely fancy fan is an interesting one because i was hoping to go elsewhere but you do look at the fact that disley's gone that colby parkinson cut some absurd deal from the rams and it is just his show now it's a new offense this is a different scheme um who knows what exactly what that will look like I don't hate taking a stab on Noah Fant late either um, because it is, it looks like the same on paper and yes, he is going to be behind those big three receivers, no matter what, and and maybe even a running back as well. Uh, But he isn't going to at least be dealing with Disley chiseling away five touchdowns this year and and Parkinson being annoying and getting on the field uh, for, for 30 snaps a a game, you know, that type of that's that that can release him potentially a bit. Um, So I, I feel a little bit better. Unfortunately, my guy Demarcus Robinson, my uh, go-to hit at the uh, the late receiver well, is now gone. Noah Brown, another one of them. Man, I, we, I was getting these guys. We, we had some of our drafts together too. The last two picks of every draft was Noah Brown, Demarcus Robinson. So, what, what, what's your uh, what's your exposure up to on Demarcus Robinson? I'm at about like six sixty percent. I have no issues with it. I especially in these drafts, but. Uh, he's going to be my, my kind of, it's, it's so much less sexy that last year it was Tank Dell for me. And, and that obviously hit huge. And then it became Kyron Williams as I was reading training camp reports as the off season went on. Um, and both were smashes, uh, obviously. And Demarcus yeah. Robinson is not going to be either of those things. He's not going to turn the, your fantasy league around as a league winner, but I do think that role is going to be steady as the, we've mm. talked about it at length the, the number three receiver McVay likes to have his three receiver sets. We've seen multiple seasons with, Three top 20 wide receivers out of it. Tutu Atwell started the year as a, a solid beast. And then Demarcus Robinson took the role over. And I, I haven't, for loving Robinson as much as I, I do, I should dig into like when he became a full-time starter, he was the wide receiver blank from week blank to blank. Because like the, he was like a top 15 wide receiver, I want to say, over he, that span. 
he took over for Tutu Atwell and he um he was running basically a full time like route participation. So and it, I'm pretty he, he, I just like thinking back to it, he had multiple games with touchdowns. So I, yeah. I imagine he was inside of the the top thirty receivers. It just it's depending on when he got that full time role. And I agree that and we we've talked about it a couple of times that he McVeigh loves his uh McVeigh loves his just running the same guys out there every single time. Oh, as we're on the clock here. Um, I'm going to go Tucker Craft. I, I, we talked about him like potentially being the full-time role there. We needed a third tight end. I don't love it, but these receivers are hideous at this point. You know, maybe Eli Moore, but Judy's there. I like Kendrick Bourne as a Pats fan. We could do Traylon Burks because we have uh, we have Levis. Maybe we stack him up. And I like this Andre guy in case they don't add a receiver there. Hey, Yoshi boss, I'll go. I'll go, Yoshi. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah, that's your, I know your uh, hometown that's favorite a, That's over a homer there. pick for sure, but uh, it is what it is. I'm, if I'm he gets up- traded, they don't make too many moves in the draft. He, he showed some glimpses last year. Big body, athletic. And at a minimum, he had a role in the red zone, and he, he caught, like, it's not even like he was catching, like, these, like, he's making acrobatic catches to pull in touchdowns. He, they were scheming up plays for him in the red zone, so they want to get him involved in the, in the offense in some capacity. So I, I don't mind that pick at all. And like you said, yeah, T it's, it's not looking like T is going to be gone. So I'm not banking on that, but um, at, at a minimum, I, I think we'll, we'll get a hand, um, a handful of touchdowns out of them. And looking at the numbers after um, Demarcus Robinson took over on a full-time role, it's a tiny sample size, but um, between weeks 14 and 18, he put up 13.6, 14.7, 20.2, 13.2 PPR points. And that was good enough for wide receiver 25. And he put up a goose egg in week 18. I believe that I don't specifically remember the Rams situation going that week. I don't know. They were resting starters that week. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. Let me look at between weeks 14 and 17. Once again, just like a tiny minuscule sample size, but wide receiver 15 for Demarcus Robinson. I was right. That's what I said. Nice. Look at that. Wide receiver 15. Yeah. And that was on the back of, let me look at the touchdown numbers there. He had, oh, okay. Yeah. He had a touchdown in four straight games. So yep. that's not going to be sustainable. But I mean, if he's on, he had route participation rates of 97%, 86%, 89%, 87% in those games. So if he's out there running routes on nearly 90% of dropbacks for Matt Stafford, I mean, yeah, I don't see how he's not paying off at his round 16, 17 price tag. Yeah, and he had he had a ten target day in there, a six target day. He, he wasn't just empty routes. He was that yeah. kind of deep lid lifter that has always the Brandon Cooks kind of role. It, it, I know it's not Brandon days. Cooks, but yeah, like I, I I'm loving it. I, I think yeah. he is such a great last yeah. round pick. What, uh, unfortunately, people have woken up to it, but I, I'm a huge fan. Um, is Tutu still there in Los Angeles? Yeah, he is, but he got completely phased out. Yeah, yeah. Um, like we've talked about, it's just three guys for Sean McVay. It's it's not like mixing a couple of guys. It's like I'm going to pick my three guys, and those are the guys who will be yeah. out there for the three wide receiver sets. It's not a – there's no rotation really. So, yeah, and they signed with that extension. So, it's seeming like they're going to – he's going to be that third guy. And, yeah, if he is and hold on to that role, the, the price seems great right now. So what do you think we do with this last pick? We have a, a two, six, eight, three build. Normally I'd say wide receiver would make sense. I'd love to have nine on this team. We did go so early though, between getting Diggs, Rome, Zay, Thomas, and, and DeAndre, you know, five of our first six picks were wide receivers or, or five or four, seven rather. Um, and, and I don't know that like maybe Slayton, Traylon Burks to stack up Levis, Odell, if he lands in Miami with all the, the rumblings there. But even like having Cooks and McConkey, who I really expect to be steady wherever he goes, I feel good about our eight receivers. I'm not opposed to getting another tight end into this room of, of Henry Conklin and Kraft. Um, as much as I don't love eight receiver builds when you have 20 picks, I like it in the 18, the best ball mania. Yeah. Um, I, I'm i not opposed to going another tight end. What do you think? I, I don't mind it either. And I, as we've been talking it up all, all afternoon about how um, successful tight ends have been under Greg Roman. So I don't mind going Parham. And even if they do bring someone in, I feel like Parham ha- will have a role 
um, in the red yeah. zone. Just he, he did last year with Everett in the building. I know it's a different scheme and coaching staff, but um, I mean, how do you not get that guy out there when when it's <laughs> close to the goal line? I mean, he, he's a he's a giant. He should be in the NBA, not the NFL. I mean, I I especially with the literal last pick in the draft. With I mean. I don't want to say it, but I don't want to like put it out there as like a guarantee, but like I can see 10 touchdowns out of him, especially if he avoids anyone else in the, in the draft. I mean, I, I think more like a handful of touchdowns is more realistic, but he, he definitely has that touchdown upside. And like you said, uh, the, the Vernon Davis days were a little bit skewed towards my, my youth. And that was me more just watching football and enjoying instead of trying to analyze it. But yeah, yeah the, the, I, I don't mind grabbing a par on here. We have 11 seconds, and I'll just toss out Waller. Worst case is retires, and it's a zero. When he announces he's not retiring, he's going to be a seven top 17 tight end, though. So yeah. I, I don't mind going either one here. All right. I'm going to put Waller up there just because it's 20 rounds, much not 18 upside. rounds. Yeah, much, it's he's the last the one. Pick of the draft. Yeah, he's the right. one that has – of course, if, if Parham did avoid it as somebody getting added there, he also could be a top uh, 15 tight end, too. So both those guys – Maybe we should have gone one of them over Tucker Craft, uh, who I don't really love either way. Uh, <laughs> but I, I I could see Waller getting right back in the top, uh, especially if they like draft JJ McCarthy or like upgrade the quarterback and he comes back and you know he was when he was in, he was the number one option in that attack. And they'll probably oh, make yeah. a move and add somebody, but I, I like I mean, the idea of Waller this late. Like the target it, he, competition is zero. It's zero. Yeah. Yeah. Um so yeah, it, it, the case obviously, of course, for Para makes sense. Like that, you made ten touchdown upside. If, if they don't make any moves in the draft, even if Waller comes back, I probably would have preferred Para. But it seems inevitable. They drafted Ben Sino, a, a, a you know Jatavian Sanders, maybe even Brock Bowers, and then suddenly you got nothing for yeah for Para. Um, I, mean, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't mind Waller at the last pick of the draft because yeah, you're normally taking a zero here anyway. So if he retires, damn shit whatever yeah, yeah. Uh, like my 20 but if he pick. doesn't we're looking at uh, probably our number one tight end in the, as the last pick so exactly <laughs> yeah you, you got to take those kinds of upside picks especially with the uh the tight end room that we set ourselves up with yeah, uh, yeah you, you gotta kind of even if yeah even what what's the opportunity cost if he retires like it's it's nothing like it is quite literally the last pick in the draft so yeah right. taking taking the upside that play there is while, while there's a case for Parham, the, the upside case is significantly greater for Darren Waller. So, that, yeah, that, that seems like the right choice there. All right. To summarize the draft, Wolfpack, as we get ready to sign off here, McCaffrey, Diggs, Allen to kick off our first three picks, getting that stack. Uh, again, we always love Josh Allen here in round three, as, as Mo pointed out. Not just the number one QB for four straight years, but like a top – Six, you know, all time four seasons. Ridiculous, <laughs> just completely ridiculous, ridiculous consistency and upside. Uh, I don't get how he falls this far every time. You know what I always think of too. I don't want to just lock in on on Allen here though. But I, I'll, I'm sick, and I always do the like mid season drafts where it pops yeah. up. You know, they, they call it the resurrection. Yeah Josh, yeah, Allen, Josh Allen goes top seven every single time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just one of those things like people recognize. Oh yeah, this guy is the difference maker of fantasy football. So I'll take him in round three every single time. Uh, Rome, Flowers, Brian Thomas, love all three of those. So we loaded yeah. up on receivers early, including Hopkins there, 73. So as you can see, five of our first seven were receivers, which made us feel comfortable going four tight ends, only eight receivers in a 20-pick draft. But you got Moss, Benson taking our stabs. We have that, that you know, nice, I'm solid really player. running back room. Yeah, I, I mean. Like you, you get the consistency with – you get the consistency with McCaffrey. We have yeah. the guys who project to be like just those touchdown guys. Like hopefully they end up with 10 to 15 touchdowns and they, they'll be plugged into our lineup maybe like six or seven times and when they score a touchdown, maybe two. And then we took a couple of swings on the on the rookies who yeah. have the potential to end up in the, those lotto spots, like um, ideally Dallas. But yeah, I think this is the, the ideal way to set up your running back room uh, centered around Christian McCaffrey. And I, I think uh, I, I think this is in terms of our running backs. This is the favorite um, running back room that I think we've had in any draft. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you too. I, I love the stabs we took. We're trying to get that Cowboys guy and, and wherever they land, Benson, Lloyd, and maybe Estime has that that every down potential. Even if he's just a handcuff. I for whatever reason I had a dream that Estime went to the Rams and then like was Kyron Williams's oh. handcuff. 
and then something happened to Kyron, and then suddenly you have the the Rams every now. I don't know why. Weird dreams to have in uh, the middle. I was of the just day. about to say you're dreaming <laughs> about like mid round draft capital running backs. March. Yeah, like, oh I have God. a very exciting life, as you can tell, <laughs> uh, for That's sure. Great. Um, but yeah, and then we as we spent a lot of our our draft rightfully discussing because it's how we ended up. You know, value tight ends: Hunter Henry, Conklin. Uh, Darren Waller, Tucker Craft's the only one. And I don't even hate Tucker Craft. I really liked him when he took over as a starter last year. Uh, and maybe he becomes the every down guy over Luke Musgrave. Uh, and he kind of he outsnapped him once they were both on the field. One pick that we haven't ever talked about that I think is now worthy of discussion before we sign off. And I think maybe this, uh, I like to figure out our, our topic before we sign off. Maybe last, like late, the last three rounds type of picks. We talked a lot about Demarcus Robinson, punt tight ends. Um, and one preview of one guy I like before we, we maybe make that our topic for next week is Michael Penix Jr. You know, running that four or five at his, as pro day, it really opened up my eyes. And now a lot of talk is he's a lock first rounder. So that means he's probably a lock starter, whether it's beginning of the year or mid season. And you're getting a Konami guy that yes, he has his injury concern. So that's why I do it. But you, you can't typically find a QB that has 800 rushing yard upside in the last two rounds of your draft. And so Michael Penix to me, is a very, very intriguing look at the names he's going around. Jonathan Mingo, Elijah, like Davis Allen. I mean, or a quarterback that could run for 800 yards that has a good arm that maybe lands with one of the better offenses because he's going later. What if he ends up being the Vikings guy because they don't trade up and he's the one that's sitting there at, at 14? He's one that, uh, as a last round stab, especially at quarterback, you know, there's really no one that intrigues me that late at quarterback. Michael Penix is somebody that I'm trying to get my last round shares of uh, before this contest fills up. What, what do you think of him? So given given the current price, yeah, the last two rounds, I, I think it's a it's a fine pick for Penix. For me, it's just all, and I think like this isn't crazy to say, and everyone's going to agree with this. For me, it's just going to come down to the landing spot. Like I've always been a fan of the talent of Michael Penix. I watched him. I wasn't there personally, but watched him almost take down my Ohio State Buckeyes when he was Indiana's quarterback. And then mm. obviously he's had those two ACL tears and then come back um, and had a resurgence in Washington. So there's nothing not to love about the guy, just like as a talent. Like I think he's an incredibly talented guy. I mean, you you saw it in the, in the later stage of the season and in, in the college football playoff, he can sling the rock. So, I mean, he, he definitely has a great arm. So it'll just come down to, to landing spot for me. I've been hearing um, him to the Raiders at 44, but that was before um, before the 40 time came out. And yeah. Like, yeah, that was like – that had people freaking out just because he, he's off the two ACL tears. So no one really saw that time coming. But we'll, we'll see where he lands. But for now, um, I think it's a great salve, like just depending on how you set up your quarterback room. Um, if you have like – maybe one of those elite guys like we did with Josh Allen, then you go like maybe two, um, two late round picks. Like I think this is one of the guys who's in the late round who has high upside. So yeah, my he'll, depending on his landing spot, he'll either be a guy who comes up a ton or like if he's just in one of those spots where he's just being groomed to take over for someone else, he'll, he'll probably go like basically undrafted. But for now, uh, I, I don't mind the, especially in the, in the 19th round, I, I think that's a fine pick. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the whole, re he's yeah. going to either be undrafted or he's going to go up by eight rounds. So, you know, yeah. in these drafts, that's kind of what we're getting at. Of course, we'll, we'll see, we're leaning into that volatility here. I think the Raiders, I mean, with Adams, Jacoby Myers, a, a good line in place. He's that could be to start over Minshew though. Like, I don't know. Uh, maybe not to start the year, but by yeah. mid season, yeah. yeah, we're talking about him as not your QB one by any means. No, I've, no chance. I've kind of been taking him. Even in my Josh Allen, Will Levis, like if he was just sitting there at the end, of, if he was our pick 240 and he was out there, it's like a why not off. type of stab, even yeah. when we probably, I don't, I guess not in the Josh Allen builds I do, but really any other builds where I haven't gone completely elite at quarterback. Okay. Um, I, I, I like snagging him. If we had them, the, the Brock Purdy, Will Levis and, you know, uh, Jaden McDa Jaden Daniels combo. And then you, you toss in Penix with one of your last two picks. I don't hate it. So he, oh he's one guy God. we'll talk about more. Uh, do you think that seems like a decent topic for next week? Uh, the, the, the last round stabs and maybe we can oh, just yeah. get like five, like la last three rounders or is there yeah. anything else? What, what else could be a potential topic? That's one that kind of pops to mind for me. I, I think that's uh that's a good topic because I think this is the last chance to grab value on some of those guys before the NFL draft. So yeah, I think that's a great thing we can talk about next week. And then once, once the NFL draft happens, that will be, 
completely reset and it'll in my opinion it'll be easier to pinpoint some of the the younger guys who are good oh, yeah. on stabs just like in terms of who has the best chance to emerge um from a running back room wide receiver room what have you so i think doing uh taking advantage and analyzing the last round stabs before and after the draft will be pretty valuable yeah we'll revisit the values we'll We'll revisit all these topics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are the best values now? I was thinking like busts too. We haven't done busts yet, but like that that's still, there's so much left to fall. And, and rather than speculating, um, once those pieces fall, we'll, we'll really have a good feel for those as well. We didn't get any comments. We did get a dude from Eric Fortis. So Eric, if you're still there, uh, I don't know if that's a dude like you love to pick we made and probably more likely a dude, what the fuck are you talking about? So <laughs> I've had like a little more context from you. Eric, feel free to comment it on in. But uh, no questions tonight. Still almost 200. You didn't quite cross the threshold, but 190 with us live here. Love to see it. Thank you guys so much. I love these Monday drafts. I'm glad we're kind of carving out a consistent 150 to 200 of you that want to just chill and hear some football talk and, and be with us. I really do enjoy these. So thank you again, guys, for being here on your way out. That thumbs up button, likes, shares, retweets. We're trying to boost that YouTube. So I know a lot of you here are on the Twitter, on the X right now watching. If you don't mind popping over to YouTube, helping us keep boosting those numbers would be awesome as we continue to grow. We're going to definitely be making some equipment upgrades, growing the channel. This is kind of the off season. We're getting the, the dust off, but man, this is always fun, Mike. I always enjoy doing these drafts with you. I think this might be my, I said it last week, but this might be my favorite team we've done uh, so far. Christian McCaffrey does help those things. Yeah. It's, uh, I like this so like much. You have the number one overall pick, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think we we set ourselves up for a pretty solid roster. A lot of a lot of chances to succeed at running back. The the clear, in my opinion, most lever the, the biggest leverage piece at quarterback and going five wide receivers in the first seven rounds. I think is a just a great way to start off any draft, uh, redraft or best ball. I think that's just a, a great way to go about it. It gives us the fun too of like where does Rome and Brian Thomas land in round one, and we can celebrate if one yeah. of them goes to the Chargers. You can we can cry if one lands with the Giants. Who knows? But I like I like leaning into the unknown in these drafts. That's where it's exactly we're gonna have so many drafts in Best Ball Mania soon where we know everything. Uh -huh. Obviously, we don't know everything, but we think we know everything. Mm -hmm. It's fun to lean into these uncertain things that, and we can gain or lose value. It it makes it more fun too. So I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Thank you again so much. All of our content writing on this. I'm going to update the rankings tonight for these best ball ranks at rotostreetjournal.com. You can find me at Roto Street Wolf. Until next Monday, Mike, have a great rest of your week. Can't wait to see you then. And hopefully you guys can join us next Monday, 4 p.m. Eastern time every Monday. Thank yep. you, guys. See you next Monday. In a world full of fantasy sheep, be the wolf, guys. Until next time. Later.